Do you want to be a part of the Cocoa community? Sure, we all do. So join this free weekly live talk show to find out how easy it is to watch at home and learn about your color computer. At the Cocoa Nation, more than 9 million men and women have participated in the community without setting foot outside their homes. And now at home in your spare time, you can see what's happening or even join the discussion. Choose from any one of these segments. Panel intros, project updates, acquisitions, Coco thoughts, featured interviews and events, the game on challenge, news, Ron's garage, Coco commercials, show coverage, panel goodbyes, or you can join one of our extra shows. You can choose from the game on challenge live or Coco tech. Join the Coco Nation right now. Click the link for the free information TJB Chris spoke about. Then decide if you want to watch the Coco Nation live show, the world's leading live weekly talk show featuring the Tandy Color computer, its siblings, cousins, and redheaded stepchildren. Visit thecoconation.com. There is no obligation and no salesman will visit you. Visit thecoconation.com. The Coco Nation Show is an unscripted, live, and interactive broadcast. Anything can and will happen. The views and opinions expressed by members of the panel and the live audience are their own, and not necessarily those of the Coco Nation Show, its sponsors, affiliates, or subsidiaries. Open minds are encouraged, and a sense of humor is recommended. Thank you for being a part of the Coco Nation. Radio Shack. Uh, okay. What? The 80s called.
Welcome to the Coco Nation, the world's first live and interactive talk show featuring the Tandy Color Computer and its hardware cousins. Everybody, welcome to the Coco Nation show, episode 347. Today we're going to interrogate Henry Gernhardt. Oh, interview, <laughs> interview. That's the right word, interview. Um, <laughs> so, uh, let's see who we got on the panel here today. In the uh, just to get everyone on the same page as mine, we need to do that. All right, in the upper left-hand corner, we got our guest of honor, Henry Gernhardt. Hey, folks, welcome to the Coco Nation. And next over, yours truly, the button pusher. Next up, Rondell Bo. I'd like to be as bright and shiny as he is over there. <laughs> <laughs> Where are we? <laughs> he, well, he's our new David Led. Uh, <laughs> really? Lots Sorry. of sunshine today, just no degrees. <laughs> uh, Should have stayed in school. Nick, Nick, send us, uh, send us some more heat back up here. I got I like plenty of It's good. <laughs> All right. Next on the panel, we got Coconut Bob, who I caught in mid drink. Hello, everybody. Welcome. <clears throat> And we I mean, should I'm... mention Coconut Bob is live streaming, building a keyboard. So if you get bored with our show, just switch to his. Well, here you get a two for one. You get to watch him and our show at the same yeah, time. Good idea. I'll switch <laughs> over. <laughs> <laughs> All right. A carriage return line feed. We got Rick Uland. Howdy, folks. And L. Curtis Boyle. Welcome to the show, everyone. Uh, Ken Waters. Hello. We adjust the color on that just a little bit there. Uh, let's see. Marco. Hey, y'all. Glad to be here. And on the next line, we got Kevin H. Hello, everybody. Hey, Terry Stiggy. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Coco Nation. And last but not least, uh, Nick Marentes. I'm always last. <laughs> Today, yeah, everyone. But you're tomorrow. That's yeah. right. Yeah, you're always first. I, <laughs> yeah. I'm, a, I'm a has been. Still haven't been able to get you to tell us what tonight's uh, lottery numbers are. <laughs> well, they've been does losing that, every day. Does that mean you're you're an expert? Because experts are has been drips. <laughs> yep, that's me. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, I guess first up, uh, Curtis, it's your turn. Yes, yeah, so our guest today, who's actually been on the panel the last few shows, so he's not really a, a guest guest anymore. He's uh, become a panel regular. And that's uh, how do you pronounce your last name? Is it Gernhardt or Gernhardt or? Yeah, you got it, Gernhardt. Gernhardt. Okay, mm -hmm. Henry for Gernhardt. All those, uh, for all those uh, NASCAR fans out there, think uh, like Dale Earnhardt, but put a G uh, in front. Uh, <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> and your number is three. Eh, believe it or not, I don't follow the. Uh, I don't follow NASCAR. I don't no, either, I not I until Mopar either. comes back. No, I'm hey, just right, in uh, it. Sorry, I'm, I'm just in it every afternoon at five. <laughs> That's why you keep leaving the show. <clears throat> <laughs> Call it the five o'clock 500. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Henry, you're, you kind of came out of nowhere because you, you started up a YouTube channel called The Break Key, as you can see in your background. Mm -hmm. And uh, you've been going for what, just over a month now, I think? Yeah, a bit over. I think I've got like six videos on there. So it might be like a couple of months. Um, yeah, so I, it's, it's been doing the doing the, the YouTube video thing has been something that I've been threatening myself with mm -hmm. um, for actually about three or four years. Uh, it just I just never got the gumption slash put it togetherness to actually do it. And... I found I found myself recently in a place where I had more disposable income than I was used to, um, and 
it wasn't much in disposable income, but it was still more than I was used to. It was enough for me to go ahead and start collecting things. And I'm like, I'm collecting all this. I better darn well make a video. What am I going to make a video of? And so I went with the whole color computer, the whole TRS-80 color computer idea. Okay. Well, I guess going with that there. So, um, and this is standard questions we ask a little of our interviews. Mm -hmm. So the first one is, uh, what was the first computer you ever used? This could be at school, a friend's house, or whatever. And do we count Hewlett Packard calculators? They compute. Hmm. I, I guess a little bit, yeah. They're, they're okay. It's like a pocket computer, <laughs> like a, like a PC. If one we or two. include, you know, if we Some include Hewlett program. Packard calculators, then the first computer I ever used was my father's HP forty one C. Um, and I actually learned how to use scientific calculators on my mom's. I think it was an HP 65 or something like it, uh, older, older, older version. So like, I think in RPN, um, right. wait, wait a minute don't... now, wait a minute. I'm sorry. Now. What? Wait a minute now. Are you, are you one of the guys that, uh, actually, <laughs> you know, turn the thing upside down and spell words? <laughs> no, I oh, saw man. that. I saw that when I was like seven and I did it twice and I was satisfied. That was oh. the, he does the equations backwards, so two two plus. <laughs> yeah, that's that's basically what it boils down to. Um, and as and I do, I think that way. So, but yeah, if we don't count that, my first computer <laughs> was um, <clears throat> excuse me, my first computer that I actually used was the TRS eighty color computer one. My father got that shortly after it was released. Uh, of course, the four K version. Um, it was rapidly, ex ex uh, very shortly thereafter, expanded to 64K with Wolfbug, and I'm still trying to find a dump of Wolfbug somewhere because I've got, that's part of my very fond um, childhood memories is looking at just the hex dumps of the of the cartridges and whatnot. Yeah, some of the other uh, bug programs we have found by the Wolfbugs and whatnot I haven't seen in decades either, so... So did you did you have computers at school too when you were younger too or I did most of my growing up in West Virginia. <laughs> so you had a still in the backyard. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't actually I didn't actually see a computer in the classroom until we moved to Huntington, West Virginia. And um Huntington, West Virginia, surprisingly, Cabell County has or had at the time the absolute best public education system as far as opportunity as far as computing capability as far as what the res what the student what was available to the students in classwork and in things of that nature the absolute best system in the state of west virginia that's not saying much but it does mean that i had opportunity in like elementary school to interact with an apple uh, apple computer an apple II. apple okay. twos were pretty you know apple twos were pretty like ubiquitous I actually didn't interact with anything at the school level until uh, other than an Apple computer, like an Apple II based uh, computer until, until I was in high school. Okay. That's not too far off me then. Cause my first interaction was with a pet in grade eight and then high school. It was an Apple II, a whole lab of them, two pluses, but I, I had the cocoa cause who could afford an Apple? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Besides which, the 6809 is such a much better processor. Oh, by far. Um, did you have any friends that were also into Cocos when you were young too, or are you kind of like the no, one? Really. No, the the, uh, the computers that people had at their the people that had computers at their houses. Um, generally, what they had were um, Apples or Commodore 64s. By the time I was actually like making friends and going to other people's houses, um, we had a neighbor who was actually on stat on faculty at Marshall University who had like an entire room full of like the eight inch TRS-80, uh, Apple II, um, I can't remember what kinds, what other kinds of machines he had in there, but it was just, you know, there were like five or six different machines in that, in that room that he had that were like, he could do a lot of stuff with. Okay. Now you'd mentioned that both of your parents had scientific calculators. So I'm assuming they must've been university degree parents type thing or yeah both of them had degree both of them had university degrees um both of them had degrees in education interestingly okay. enough and um so with with mom having mom was an army brat 
dad was a um, government services brat. Um, dad's been around the world a couple of times during his childhood and graduated from the high school in Okinawa. Um, mom's father was at one point in time, the head chef for general Douglas MacArthur. And when he wasn't doing that, he was working in the nuclear warheads program. Um, so definitely a scientific and mathematical background. Of yeah. Some sort. Yeah. Very much so. And so when they get, when they, when they came out, when they came out uh, of college and they got together and everything shortly after I was born, they were looking for an opportunity and one came in the way of the Bureau of Indian Affairs. So they took a job with the BIA um, and for four years, a little over four years, we were in the Yukon Delta of Alaska. Those are my earliest memories. It is in the okay. Yukon Delta of Alaska. But when we got back, mom was overqualified to take a position in education. And so she wound up going back to school and her education degree was in kinesthesiology, basically. And so when she went back to school, she went back to school for computers. Dad was already a tech head. You know, so he was he was doing he was doing his own thing in that regard. But mom actually went back and started learning like system 360 assembly language, um, started working with some mainframes. And that basically wound up coming home because, OK, great. Dad's a tech geek. Mom's doing tech stuff. Wonderful. Let's get a computer and let's have the kids. Let's let the kids play with it. <laughs> so did you get to log into timeshares in some of these systems and then use them yourself, too, or? Not not that early on. Um, it was it was not until I was in my uh, late single digits that um, I actually got to experience that. Mom start mom got a job with uh, Radio Shack, and so we're effectively a Tandy family as a result of that. Uh, mom got a job with Radio Shack probably about the time I was in the third grade, um, and she became a she became a technical a technical person for their computer center, and. So what I did get to do is I got to dial into one of their Model 16s um, over, at, over at the store, which I had a lot of fun with. And that was my first introduction to Unix. The Model yeah, 2000. Xenix, right? Or Xenix, Xenix, yeah. Yeah, yeah Xenix. Um, the Model 2000 was my first introduction to VersaCAD. And um, so... You know, I've got all this... I've got all this computing technology that's like right in front of me that's not necessarily beyond what's available but was more than i would otherwise experience given the economic conditions at the time if mom didn't have the job in the computer field okay now just a bit of a side here you'd mentioned like you you think in reverse polish notation um so were you a fan of fourth then or did you use fourth on the coco at all i did not i've never seen fourth on the coco i've never seen one um but i was i did run across later in life <laughs> I ran across um, a fourth-like implementation of a, an implementation on, of all things, a multi-user dungeon, a, a multi-user, uh, yeah. And so, in playing with that, I like, I just kind of fell in love with the with the way that the language works. Um, coming back around to it because, like, one of the things that I'm working on right now is the fourth inter is a fourth interpreter, fourth based OS. Yeah. Um, you no. Know, Coming back around to that, it's like I play. I played with uh, G Fourth on my PC, and I found myself just like it's. It's just absolutely so intuitive for me to start building these things out and to and to start combining things. It I don't have to think as much. There's not as much state. I'm the complete opposite with Fourth. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we. I I know one of my uh, fellow uh, Coco users here. Um, in the early eighties, had I think it was the Hoyt Stearns Electronics Fourth, mm. and uh, we used to show it off at of club meetings. And I remember the speed that it was capable of doing, and the fact that you kind of build your own commands as you go is kind of the way the right. language is set up. Yeah, and fourth so, is a fourth is a compiled language, yeah. and so that has its boon and that has its bane. So you write your you write your word, and it's immediately compiled, and the compiled code is set aside and put into the dictionary. That's a boon. But the bane is that if you need to modify that word, or if you need to modify if you need to modify that word, then you can either shadow it, or you have to dump just about everything else and that that references it. Because once you start building references to it, and you go and you change it, you've got to recompile absolutely everything. Yeah. Yeah, and as you hinted, that's that's a project you're working on, which we'll get get to in a little bit here. Mm. Um. I have a critical question. Uh -oh. Go ahead. 
uh, how did the brake key become an important part of your life? <laughs> oh, no, it's I was I was looking for I was actually just looking for how do I, you know, how do I make a little bit of a pun? And so I take a break by playing with the computers, by playing with the old computers, playing with the Coco, um, doing programming, Jeez. doing, you know, hardware stuff, something like that. That's that's how I take a break. And so I figured, all right, the stuff that I'm putting on here is stuff that I do when I take a break. A lot of it's Coco. Eh, break key. There we go. <laughs> and and yeah. it's red. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> now, now speaking of the coco so you, your dad had a coco when you were younger did he follow mm -hmm. through right through the coco 3 era too or did you just have the coco 1 and then went on to pc no the or? um the coco 1 was the family computer and um then later on we got a coco 2 the coco 1 may, remained primary i think we kept the coco 2 but the coco 2 was purchased um because we were having interfacing issues with a science fair project I was doing in robotics and robotic controls. Um, so the Coco 2 wound up not necessarily being the solution that we needed. I think we kept the machine because it had been cheap and we could use the other machine somewhere else. But all the build out was done on the one. And um, he, dad didn't go on with that because he did business work on the three and that moved on from the three to a uh, to a PC compatible. Are we talking Coco three or TRC Model three here? Ah, uh, TRC Model three. Sorry. Okay. Okay. So you guys kind of skipped over the Coco three at the time. Yeah, we skipped over the Coco three. By okay. the time the nine, by the time the uh, Coco three had hit, um, we were already pretty uh, firmly established in the PC realm. Yeah, uh, that that's a rather common thing. Or people went to the Amiga. That was the other fairly common one. Oh, I wanted an Amiga. I wanted an Amiga so bad. <laughs> So I, I guess one question, <clears throat> because you've had, you know, parents with mathematical scientific backgrounds, technical backgrounds, did you ever become a gamer like most typical kids did at the time? Or did you actually stick with the programming as your main focus on the Coco? I was never able to really, um, I was never able to really hang in with computer games. They got boring for me very, very quickly. It's like, okay, what's, what's the point? Um, I discovered why much later in life, but you know, it's like, okay, this isn't, this isn't necessarily fun. I was still having fun with figuring out how the system worked and with making the system do what I wanted it to do. And also with the hardware side of things, you know, I was, uh, what I was, well, I was 1981. So that would have been, I was an almost seven or something like that when we got the Coco and I taught myself, I almost immediately taught myself basic on the thing and went straight from there to like at, the, at 10, I pull, I pulled the book on 6809 assembly. I'm like, Oh, I could do this and this and this and this. And, this. and um, by the time I was 12, I was also, I was also teaching myself electronics from my father's old bell and Howell uh, thing uh, vector, you know, including the vector math and everything with that. So I was very much a, I want to figure it out and I want to build stuff type of a person. Okay. I, I, the reason I asked, I kind of suspected that was the case, that games wouldn't have been a big part of your life as a, even as a kid. But there's usually a few games that kind of like bridge the gap. And some of them are like, like Rocky's Boots or something that actually teaches you electronics. You probably were already a little bit too advanced before mm -hmm. that came out. And then there's others that just seem to click the bright buttons like Dungeons of Dagger. That's a common one with a lot of the programs like Rick Adams, myself, and a bunch of others like that was something we did get into, one of the very few. And I was wondering if you had any of anything like that or... Or was it just too limiting on software in West Virginia at the time? Dungeons and Daggereth was actually like, I mean, of all the games, on, of the, all the games on there, the one that I, I didn't necessarily return to, but the one that I actually found the most fascinating was Dungeons and Drag Dungeons of Daggereth. Um, okay. It was the only one of its type. And I'd experienced text adventures before. Text adventures could reel me in, um, especially if they were like relatively shortish. But, um, Dungeons of Dagrath, I found to be very, very interesting. I got frustrated with it because I couldn't figure out how to make it very far. <laughs> okay. Now, you'd mentioned that um, 
your your family basically switched over to the PC. So I guess uh, I don't know how much time elapsed. You can let us know before you got back into the cocoa side of things. Did you manage to keep a cocoa throughout that time, or is that something that it all got sold off and then you had to kind of get back into it and buy back into it? No, the one got sold off. Um, I was late high school, I think, maybe when it when it got to us, uh, sold off. And the and the entire system got sold off, which was fine. The kid who was getting it was going to be able to use it. Um, and the two, I don't know what happened to that, but uh, I actually didn't manage to hold on to anything. I've had a lot of moves, and some of those moves have been way too rapid. So a lot of the stuff that I had as a child, I have no idea where it is or if it even still exists. Okay. <laughs> So what what prompted you to get back into it? You mentioned that you you kind of you picked up some stuff, then you decided to do a YouTube channel. I'm assuming the cocos might have been part of that. Um, but what what made you was, go, come back to it? Yeah, I was. Uh, this is uh, probably about three years ago or so. Um, it was pre pandemic. I can tell you that much. Um, but not very far pre pandemic. I had gotten to. I had what was it? I had gotten into a conversation with one of my friends at work and he's a, he's a pretty strong gamer. And he was talking about, um, I, I can't remember what he was talking about, but for whatever reason, the concept of uh, Dungeons of Dagrath came to my mind. And I'm like, I should look that up. And I did. And I brought the, uh, and I, and I brought up, I don't, I, I brought up um, the emulator on, uh, I believe it was online first in Dungeons of Drag Dagrath, and it's like, okay, you know, okay, this is about what I remember. This is the frustration I remember. This is, okay, this is why I stopped <laughs> playing it, because I got this frustrated. What else is here? And I managed to get it to, I don't, uh, managed to get into, I don't remember how, but I managed to get to the okay prompt, just to the okay prompt. And it's sitting there, and I'm looking at that blink, and I'm looking at that color cycling cursor, and I'm like, I remember this. And it's just brought down the wave of nostalgia. And I probably about six months, eight months prior to that, been playing around with AVR microcontrollers and AVR assembly language. And I'm like, I remember this. I know what this processor is. I know I learned this before. This could be, this is going to be relatively simple and this could be relatively fun. So yeah, let's, let's do that. <laughs> Now, did you live entirely within emulators at the beginning, or would you right off the bat when you decided to get back into it start hunting down real hardware again? No, I started. I, I I've been really I've been hunting down the real hardware. Uh, I started hunting down the real hardware probably about three or four months after that. Um, stuck mostly with emulators, even to this day. I stick most I stick mostly with the emulator, and that's mainly because, like, what I'm doing right now, most of my time is spent doing this development and everything like that. And I don't have anything to burn my ROMs onto. <laughs> but the, main, no, the debuggers got, are pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. I, I like, I yeah. like being able to work with MAME in that regard. How be that as it, as it may, if I'm building hardware for the real hard, if I'm building hardware for the real, real hardware, such as um, my D pad or the cable that I did, or if I'm going to be installing the, installing the uh burning an EEPROM and installing it then i'll use the real hardware for that i'll use the real hardware for playing you know if i'm going to go on game on challenge if i can put it on the real hardware i'll do that um i like using the real hardware i just don't like using the real hardware to program <laughs> <laughs> well especially when you get into larger assembly language projects you know how long it takes to assemble and stuff on the real mm -hmm. hardware it becomes an issue mm -hmm. you're just doing quick little things it's not too bad but no, I mean, and there's there's times like, ah, I would like to have a ROM monitor or something that gives me that right now, but yeah. Okay. Um, now you mentioned that you never had a Cocoa Three back in the day. <clears throat> you don't have one now, from what I believe you said on on the show before. Do you have plans mm -hmm. to try to get one of those to see what the next level was like? Because you've missed the whole OS Nine Level Two train and everything else. Then back in the um, day, so I'm kind of curious. If you have a curiosity for it, I'm not really that terribly curious about it, and it's mainly because I'm looking at what the chipset that's in there now is capable of, or for the one and the two, and I'm like, 
I know this has been exploited to a certain extent later on. And I know that the, the, what I want to look into has probably already been done. But OK, so the VDG, it's got you can do external character generation with it. Yeah. L let's put on a daughter board, lift a pen and see what we can do. You know, play with that. <laughs> Kitty says, I'm staying here whether you like it or not. <laughs> That's pretty well it. Yeah. Yep. Um, but yeah, so it's like the VD and look and just looking at what the what the things you can do with the VDG are, what you can do with um like just the hardware as it is, the mappings that you can the what kind of hardware would be needed to add like memory mappings to do a lowercase mod, um, what would be needed to take the VDG and just basically go from VDG to gimme as it were, maybe not exactly gimme, but if I were to go through that process and get there, if I'm looking at going to the point of like Coco three, full Coco three compatibility and effectively in my own slow process that AC eight, AC's eight bit can probably do in six months will take me three years, get to a point of gimme compatibility. You know, I want to start with the Coco two and I'll get the Coco and I'll get a Coco three when it comes to the point of okay this is how it's supposed to run okay so for me it's it's the uh the learning the discoverability that's more the the appeal than just you know what the hardware the software yeah absolutely because once you get to i mean once you, with the discoverability with the t uh discoverability especially with the coco one the discoverability on the one is insane because the whole thing's laid out right there in front of you with the two, they put a lot of the functions into the salt chip and they put a DAC in there, um, which reduces some discoverabilities, some discoverability, but not all of it. And yeah. even at the two, you've still got like you can discover a whole bunch of stuff about what's going on. Yeah. I mean, even Kieran, he's been discovering like these little timing modes you can do on the SAM and the VDG where you can start getting like the equivalent of smooth scrolling going. I want source code. I want to see what's going on. I can't figure <laughs> it out myself. At least not yet. There you go, Karen. <clears throat> I think he's in the chat. I didn't <laughs> check. <laughs> so uh, your your projects on your channel have actually been a mix of hardware and software. You've, you've done like drive wire cables and you've done, or you're working on your fourth ROM. Mm. Um, do, you, do you have longer terms? So like obviously the fourth ROM is going to be a, a fairly long series because that's a fairly complicated right. project to, to handle. Do you plan on kind of interspersing other things in between to kind of keep it fresh or or do you want to finish that first then go on? And do you have any further long-term plans of which one? At go? some point I'm going to go, at some point I'm going to do something about an EEPROM programmer. Um, and I'm not sure what that's going to look like. Um, you know, it's, it's going to have to be interspersed. I've got like one more thing that I, one more thing that I can put on there right, uh, right off the rip as far as the fourth, uh, the fourth ROM project is concerned. And then we're going to go into compilers <laughs> and I've never written a compiler before. So this should be fun, but you know, it makes sense to go ahead and uh, stop there, do a couple of little hardware things. Um, and as far as, as far as that goes, keep, I'm going to keep plugging along with that, with the, with the fourth, uh, with the fourth project. Um, probably have, like you're saying, a couple of small hardware, uh, hardware things in the middle of it. And at some point, one of the hardware things that I definitely want to do is, like I'm saying, lift the pen on the VDG and uh, pop that in there and see what happens. Yeah, you can even add stuff like the inverse video switch and stuff on there, too. That's a very popular oh, yeah, absolutely. mod back in the day. Cool. Um, getting a bit distracted, stupid cat in my lap here, but... <laughs> Um, I was wondering, says, like, me. like you, you seem to have come back to like the assembly language programming and stuff fairly quickly. Now, I don't know, if, like you said, you started getting back into things about three years ago. Um, I'm not sure if you were kind of like studying up and refreshing your memory on that, or did you kind of get into the assembly language like very recently again? And it does like, do you have your day job doing hardware and software that has kind of kept your skills up during this time, or, or did you always so have a hobby job... doing it? Yeah, my day job is a combination of things. Um, like I work in addiction recovery and I've got some, um, I'm going to call it headquarters level stuff that I do, which is overarching for the entire, uh, for the entire organization. 
And then I've got some center level stuff that I do for the headquarters level stuff that I do. I do custom programming. Um, I work in the lamp stack. Uh, I also do video production and uh, I take and I do the data analytics that that they might need. So I've got all that. I've got a lot of that going. I've got a lot of that going on. So you're basically at things. work. You're doing a lot of things that actually you're doing on your YouTube channel. You're doing video production. You're doing coding, yep. et cetera. Yep. Yep. And, and so I hang around. And then when you hang around with this group, we're definitely going to need the therapy. <laughs> <laughs> Cocoa addiction's not a disease. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> oh goodness, no. But the, uh, but yeah. So assembly is something that I've. I mean, I I tend to dive down into the low level anyway, and. Assemblies as close to the hardware as I can get without actually building the hardware. And trust me, I've had I've considered projects where I'm building the hardware, um, like FPGA, CPLD, that type of thing. Or, or are you talking like oh, just no, just the, design more than anything else, and then okay. figuring out how to get that design onto? Because like I, I've on and off played around with building a stack based microprocessor or designing a stack based microprocessor, like a zero operand instruction set effectively yeah like the old hp 3000 minis i used to have at work mm -hmm. so or registers are literally memory locations there's no real registers besides a program yeah. counter and the condition code yeah in this case in this case though i would have an accumulator it's just the accumulator would be the x register and then you it it effect it'd effectively be like imagine as imagine fourth but assembly language okay <laughs> <laughs> can it's you a see comment that i haven't been able to watch comments left too much lately so it's something like a uh, ben eater project um no because it's mostly happening in it's not happening on breadboards it's mostly happening on um logisem or a logisem equivalent hmm, okay okay and just out of curiosity it's like at at your work and at home, other than your retro stuff here, what what do you currently use? Are you a, a Linux guy? Are you a Windows guy? A Mac OS ten guy? A... I am, thankfully, a Linux guy. Oh my goodness! I um I've been using Linux uh, as my primary operating system routinely since about two thousand four, and um, I've been using I I I used it back as a primary operating system in like 96, 97. And I've just, there's just using the, using the, uh, the Linux, uh, using Linux based operating systems and using the, and using the X window, X windowing system and what that has available for it. Windows is only now starting to get to the level of functionality that I need from my windowing environment. <laughs> yeah. Like remotes <laughs> through X windows, et cetera. Not even that. It's like, okay, virtual desktops. That started being a thing in 10. You know, and at least a very accessible thing in 10. And then now, so so now they've got that. There's a few other things that are like uh quality of life things where it's just this is Windows and that is um and and that is uh Lin and that is a Linux-based OS. Um, where it's just like, okay, it's just a difference, no big deal. However, on Windows also, it's like one of the things that I use all the time is alt drag hold down the alt key and then just dra and then the click drag to move the window by and of itself windows doesn't have that okay put that in there windows just put that in there you know um little bits and pieces of what i'm used to that are just there on any linux based installation that aren't there on windows i was trying to use windows on this newest pc build um, actually it's one that I bought from micro center, but I was trying to use, I was trying to use windows and it was okay. Uh, until I started using blender to do, uh, and doing my video editing and blender kept hiccuping and hesitating and doing all that. And I'm like, what's going on? So I went ahead and installed Linux on the other, on the other drive. All the, all my problems went away. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I just wasn't sure. Away. I wasn't sure if your job required you to use, say, Windows at work for certain things or not. But it doesn't sound I, like it does. If I need to, if I need to use Windows, I can virtual machine it through Wine or and something like that. What's that? Through Wine or something like that, or no? Actually, I VM it. Oh, VM it. Okay. 
Yeah, the KVM or something. I use KVM, and I'll hypervise on the Linux side, and uh, then just use uh, QMU for the uh, QEMU for the uh, Windows side. And there are a couple of machines that I have to operate that I have to interrupt interact with that do run Windows, but the specific machine that I use that I can't not run Windows on is our uh, CNC controller. So I have to run Windows on that one. Okay. Now, for those who have not been on your channel, I'm just going to screenshot, or not screenshot, but screen share your YouTube page. Mm -hmm. And as you can see here, I mean, it's it's saying one month ago, but I think it, it's kind of very coarse <laughs> as to what it's mm -hmm. describing that as. So it's probably just slightly under two months is when you started here. Yeah. So you started at, at first with a cassette cable, you know, starting very basic, because I think at that time, I don't think you had a Coco STC yet. Is that correct? No, I still don't have a Coco STC. Oh, okay. So yeah. you're still running everything off cassette, basically, or do you have a disk drive? I'm actually control? bootstrapping with D-Load on DriveWire. Oh, okay. So are you using HDB DOS under there? Or? Yep. Yeah. Okay. So uh, for the viewers here, um, or the listeners, I should say, that can't see the screen here, you've uh, your six videos that you currently have up, building a tier city cassette cable, building a drive wire cable, building a D-pad from scratch, which you kind of briefly showed earlier, um, which was a two-parter. Uh, a custom Coco ROM, and this is actually your your long term series where you've kind of just figuring out how the hardware works, how interrupts work, etc. Yep. And then you know the second episode of that is pulling the keyboard where you're going through the PIAs and figuring out the whole roll column strobes and stuff like that work. Mm -hmm. Um, as as the six videos that you put up, like obviously the the long term project of doing a fourth on ROM is is something you have planned. Were the other ones just kind of winging it as you needed it, or was that sort of a part of a grand plan to get you up to the point where you're doing the ROM? I woke up on Monday and I said, what am I going to do? On Tuesday, I said, I should do this. On Wednesday, I did it. So on Thursday, it, basically. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> like, I, I know you started joining our uh, Game On Challenges, and I was wondering, maybe you didn't have joysticks, and that's why you decided to build the D-pad at that particular time, because you wanted to use it in, in the Game On Challenge. Like, I didn't know if you were reacting to what was happening or was that just something you just wanted to do anyways? Oh, that's, um, it was something that it was something that I was definitely responding to. And I know that most of the Coco games respond well to a D pad type of interface as compared to having the full analog range. So it's like, Hey, this will work. I don't have full analog yet. And even so full analog could be annoying for these. So let's try it. Yep. No, I'd have to say like probably 85, 90% of the games uh, don't need analog. The ones that do really do need it, but and, uh, yeah. yeah. What is it? Androne, Androne definitely needs it yeah yeah we just need ken to pick better games now that's all <laughs> right ken okay. oh he left no comment <laughs> now i'm trying to remember like you said you knew you never had experience with the coco 3 yet currently you have no driving desire to really go into it unless you want to start building yourself up to one mm. um have you had any experience using it on the game on challenge? Because I'm trying to remember if we've covered any Coco three specific games since you kind of joined the. There the have been Coco well. three. There have been Coco three specific games, um, and I have. I mean, I've I've enjoyed the games that have been there for the Coco three specific games, and I've I've definitely done that under emulation. Um, and thanks again to Karen for XROAR. That's an absolutely amazing, amazing emulator. Um, but yeah, it's. It's, I mean, it's, it's good for the graphics, at least as far as I can tell, and for the gameplay aspect of it, for, as far as I can, I can tell. I haven't really done anything else with it yet. And, okay. like, I'm, you know, I'm, pers I'm personally looking at, uh, looking at, okay, what does it do? What does it, what does it bring to the table that's more than games? And I know it does, especially when you drop a 6309 in there. Um, there's much more that can be done with graphics and visualizations and, and, and things of that nature, especially with it having the RGB. And I think it does, what is it? 320 by 240 is the biggest one or, uh, 640, 640 by, by 225 is the maximum. Oh, 640 by 225. Yeah. So that's, that's going to be great for, that's going to be great for like scientific visualizations or like if you're wanting to do any type of, any type of design work or what have you, it's good for more than just, it's good for more than just, ga uh, games. This I know, um, 
it's not it's not necessarily what I would have used it for. Part of what kind of pulled me away from being in the being in the cocoa sphere as far as looking at the cocoa three was when I was about 10 years old, I was donated a CPM machine. And I got to I got to working on a native 80 by 25 column display doing the doing the work uh, like with the uh, the word processing, writing my papers, what have you. Um, basic day-to-day -day stuff. That was my machine. It wasn't the family machine. It was my machine. And so if a Coco 3 had come around, around that uh, and into my life around that time as a family machine, I don't know that I would have necessarily had more use for it. Yeah. I mean, they, they, the Coco 1 and 2 did have 80 column cards since like 82, 83. Yeah. In fact, Radio Shack sold one of them in the Word Pack too. Um in fact, with OS 9 level one, we used to use that as a terminal because you had a bigger screen there. They had natively on the Cocoa, even though you're both running off of it. But, yep. Um, yep. But but given your 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 Linux and, and Unix background, it, uh, I would be interested to hear if you ever get a chance try just need a break from you know the regular projects. Want to just fire it up for a day? Maybe trying Nitrous Nine because it's it's a Unix based. It's not Unix. Fusix is closer mm -hmm. to the actual Unix, but it would be interesting to see your take on that because it had the multitasking, the windowing, the virtual, well, kind of virtual desktops, I guess you could call it. But it sounded like it was more up up, up your alley, but you probably were already, you know, well past even looking at the Cocoa as an option by the time it came out in 86. I didn't even know that it had come out. <laughs> in all honesty. Yeah, I mean, I... I... My, the at that that was the point where Tandy was starting to where Tandy was starting to like fall away a little bit. Yeah, they're kind of and, becoming a uh, me too. I mean, they were the Tandy one thousand series. I mean, it did for the game players anyway. It did, did have the sound chip built in and Tandy enhanced graphics and stuff like that. So it was a bit that's above. Why, that's why now I'm now I remember why it wasn't a thing for me because the computer center was no longer located in Huntington. Um, mom's job had moved to Dunbar, uh, right next to Charleston. And okay. so there, it, so it wasn't as close and I didn't hear about those kinds of things and the types of computers that mom and dad would have been interested in that mom would have possibly brought home, which she didn't do anymore, would have been along the lines of the PCs and whatnot. Yeah. So yeah, yeah just Tandy, even... Tandy at the beginning of the, uh, when they started doing the IBM PC compatibles or even just the MS-DOS compatibles like the Tandy 2000, the first one. Actually, was doing still some doing some innovation. I mean, honestly, the Tandy One Thousand was more like, uh, and I've been PC Junior with a proper keyboard, mm -hmm. and you know, you know, different different models, etc. The the model two thousand actually had more advanced graphics than most PCs, etc. But it chose the one eighty six, which is kind of an oddball yep. choice. The only other place I've ever seen that used was a management tally line printer <laughs> type <laughs> thing. Um, but you know, by the time they got into the multimedia stuff and started getting to three eighty six and forty six, then it was just becoming me too. This is the whole clone market, you know, the compacts, the Dells, yeah. the Tandys, yeah. And they kind of lost. I mean, that was IBM. It was even kind of getting tired of it, trying to come up with micro channels, a way to kind of lock other people out. And they just came up with the ISA instead, and you know, it was kind of just going that way. Now, you had mentioned before that you were th you would love to have an Amiga. Was that something back in the day you also were thinking of getting, as opposed to going into the PC side of things? Or no, it was it was in addition to. Um, the, the, it was the sound and graphics capabilities that the thing had that See, really that's the part me. I find odd because that was really pushed on the media for games and you're not a gamer. So what mm -hmm. was the appeal for you as far as that goes? I didn't, I did I wasn't shown the games. Um, I didn't see the games on the Amiga. Uh, what I was hearing about, and this was like my, my first year in college when I was hearing about this, I was hearing about, oh, you've got the video toaster. So it's doing yeah. all these amazing graphical things and amazing. Started by an ex-Coco guy, by the way. Mm -hmm. That wouldn't surprise <laughs> me. Um, the guy created so, Coco Max is the one who made the toaster. Ah, got it. Got it. But yeah, so it was, uh, and it was also the sound, the, the sound capabilities that it had because no other product on the market at that time was giving you four channel digital, uh, was giving you four channel digital audio. Yeah. And now, given it was eight bits per channel and whatnot, but um, still, the capability, it's, mu it's uh, sound capabilities and it's graphical capabilities, not under the auspices of games, but just for what it was, was what really impressed me, along with its, uh, as long with its general computing capability. Like, here was, a, here was a device that could do everything a PC does, and it has great sound and great graphics. 
the, to play around with. Yeah. And it had a that preemptive what, multitasking operating system too, which yep, the PC yep. didn't really have. And it was those and it was those it was those technological advancements that were driving me to it. Things that the PC didn't have that the Amiga had. It's like, oh, I want to play with this. Okay. So what 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 caused you not to go that route instead of PCs? Money. Ah. So we're talking the original <laughs> Amiga when it was like quite expensive, like Apple II prices. Yeah, it's it's it was it was a case. Of, um, keep in mind that West Virginia is an economic black hole. Yeah, Aaron and Boat have told me that many times. Yes, and um, they are not incorrect. They are absolutely correct. You know, um, abandon all money, ye who enter here. Uh, <laughs> so, not only was I in, not only was I in a position where there wasn't much in the way of economic opportunity, but I was also in a position where. The economic opportunity that did exist and could be exploited was not sufficient to the task of purchasing a two thousand dollar machine in nineteen ninety and nineteen ninety one. Okay. So yeah, I had been actually accepted to Virginia Tech, and had I gone to Virginia Tech, getting the machine that I needed, an AT class computer with a twenty no forty megabyte hard drive, I think they required. And an AT class computer with at least uh, Hercules graphics on it. Getting that would have been more than a stretch. That would have been like, or how in the world is that going to happen? Yeah. Yeah, the Amiga was kind of caught because it was, it was a super powerful machine with a super powerful operating system. And like you said, it had digitized on a lot of other computers like the Atari ST and a bunch of others had multi-channel music but it was all done through synthesizer chips so you did not have digital playback we could do whatever the heck you wanted type thing ironically the coco did but it was only six bit single channel but um yeah it's it's like i had some friends here that were amigas i had one guy who was a cartoonist and he used it for doing all of his you know digital cartoons etc some other people use macs for that but uh and it sounds like the mac never interested you at all no the mac the bit see okay coco Boots to basic. You got a command line interface. CPM boots to command line interface. TRS uh, TRS DOS boots to command line. Got an interface. B, uh, MS DOS command line. Everything's command line, command line, command line. And so I don't have to use a GUI. And at that stage in my life, GUIs were not something that I was accustomed to using in the first place. <laughs> I was exactly okay. the same I, way. <laughs> right. And so now the Amiga. Sure, you've got Workbench in there. But you can still pull up something that will give you a terminal window or where you can interact with the operating system using a command line. Not the Mac. Nope. Not unless you ran AUX years later. But Yep. And so the Mac was, it was like a, a what's the point type of a thing. I, I was, I would use a Mac for like when I was in, when I was in high school, in our journalism class, we used a Mac for Aldous PageMaker to go ahead and do our, our our high school newsletter, newspaper. That's fine. That's understandable. That capability came came out on PCs within about three or four years, if I recall correctly. You know, so I was like, what's the point with Macs until OS X or OS X? And once OS X came around, that was based off of Next Step, which was based off which was based off of BSD. You know, and yeah. so it's got a like a mock style kernel in it. It's like, oh, okay, I don't have to worry about the, you know, on OS 10, I don't have to worry too much about the GUI. I can just go ahead and bring up a terminal window and type out the commands that I need to type. Yeah. And yeah. I'm good. So what what machines do you own, own now? <clears throat> and is the Coco the only one of the retro ones? Or or do you have some other retro ones that you're interested in? Well, like you mentioned, you do CPM. Yeah, I've got uh, a Capro too. I've got a Capro 2. I still need to get a GoTech for that one um, and figure out what's going on. I'm not sure whether the floppy drives need to be aligned or what. Uh, so there's that. Those are the only two retro machines that I have are the Coco 2 and the uh, and the Capro 2. The other machines that I personally have, eh, a laptop and a desktop, and then they're the work machines. <laughs> okay. So you, you have a bit more uh, interest in retro than just the Coco. You've got some other machine yeah. that you're still fond of etc now do you yeah, plan on doing was... any videos with those as well or you, is this the break key being the you know break, bright red break key of the coco is it meant to be a, a coco specific channel or do you plan expanding that later i'm pretty sure that i'm going to stick with uh coco and coco related stuff on the break key 
Um, the brand, the brand, I was originally not planning on that being the case, but the branding just winds up working altogether too well that way, in my opinion. So okay. as for the other things, the other things like, sure, I might go ahead and I might go ahead and put something together, but where am I going to put it? That, that'd be kind of like exploring another channel if I'm going to do another channel. However, as we know by our like five hour long episodes that we have <laughs> on the Coco Nation, there's so much in the Coco world that this just doing Coco stuff we can keep you busy for several lifetimes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I have to agree. I don't have enough time to do all my projects as it is. Um, Mark Oberoser, I haven't had a chance to really monitor the chat here. Has there been any questions from there? And also anybody on the panel, if anybody has any questions too, I don't want to just take over the entire interview portion of the show. I'm just getting caught up because I've been scrolling back. But yeah, there's been a couple. Uh, so if you haven't addressed them, then I'll go back here and find it. Um, do 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 Anybody else in the panel while Mark's looking at it? Like Ken, you were promising to be a co-interviewer there. Uh, Tricob asked, uh, Henry, what's your favorite Coco related memory? Uh, you might've already covered that, but. Oh, favorite, my favorite Coco related memory. Um, well, I would have to say, because um, when I was 10 years old um, and I was, uh, this was in uh, sixth grade, the science project I did for the fair that year was um, robotics, you know, and I got I'd managed to gather up some pieces of a hero one, including the entire arm. Awesome. And dad had found, yeah, uh, we didn't have the processor for it, <laughs> but that's okay. You, I was, oh, just the arm, to, right? Yeah, I, I had the arm built out like a shell of a body out of a shop back in an old uh, old hard drive pack. Um, you know, to attach the arm to it. It was just kind of fun building this thing. And now it wasn't so much the arm itself. The reason I say, the uh, reason I'm, I'm making this Coco related is because I still can't find the, I still can't find the issue. It would have had to have been around 82 or 83, but it was like an interface, an interface board, not the Armatron interface board that was done in 84, but an interface board, I think using the, um, using the PIAs. Um, it was either the Pias or the Moss Vias. I'm not sure which was used, but that plugged into the side of the machine and it gave me a whole bunch of channels of control for the hero arm to the point where I could run all the axes and things of that nature and did research into that and computer control of it. And this was done on the Coco. And I'd have to say like uh, going, going to the county fair, going to the county level fair and receiving the receiving first place for my division, you know, my age range with that Coco was pretty darn cool. Awesome. So have you thought about my question would be, have you thought about doing any follow-ups with that, doing some more stuff now? As far as robotics are concerned? Yeah. Um, the Coco. Um, possibly later because that, because the cartridge port, you know, when I was a kid, it's like, Oh, you just stick games in there. But then, oh, you can do more than just stick games in there. It's an expansion interface. You know, it's like having an S100 bus like, or something like that. So let's play with that. And so have I thought about it? Not actively, but it's sitting there in the back of my mind. <laughs> <laughs> I actually have some cards from my Apple II from a company called John Bell Engineering. And they're basically uh, um, 6522, which is like, you know, a 6821 or 22. Mm -hmm. And then it has, because there's... Um, uh, 16 bits on each one for output and has 32 output, you know, input or output channels. So you can mm. program an input or output and then you can drive something like a relay or whatever. So, yep. and that could easily be cloned to be put on the Coco. So, oh yeah, and, absolutely. And the cards are only about this big. Hmm. And then you could program it in fourth because you buy a time you have your mm -hmm. ROM done. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Combine the two projects. So I discovered when I was about 35 or 36 that I like control systems. That's, uh, mm. so that's what I've been doing for the last 20 years now is working with monitoring control systems. So, so a fun little, fun little fact, speaking of control systems and automation, guess what else we had hooked up to our Coco one at the house? M10, X10, I mean. X10. Yep. Yep. <laughs> All the light switches. 
Yeah. All the light switches in the house were those buttons. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like you had a pretty decent sized uh, cocoa system back there. Did you guys have disk drives and stuff too? The cocoa. Yeah, we had. Cocoa uh, I believe we had the dual. Uh, by the time everything was spit out, um, we had dual disk drive system on an M uh, MPI, the gray one, and okay. um, yeah, so that ran into that ran into the cocoa one itself. The DMP, uh, it was the uh, it was the line printer seven was what we had, and I've actually been considering the relative merits of going ahead and picking one of those up because <laughs> printers that absolutely suck. <laughs> Why yeah, that not? That was one of the ones without descenders, wasn't it? Uh no, it had descenders, but not true descenders. Um, as in, like it would lift the it would it would yeah. lift it would yeah. the, the character box would be exactly where it is. But instead of putting the instead of dropping two uh, two it would shift pins, it up. Yeah, yeah, it just shifted up. Okay, yeah, because I think the, the 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 LP series I think was before the DMPs, if I remember correctly. Like the LP seven would have been before, say the DMP one hundred. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those were those were the early ones. Those were the gray box. Yeah, and you you mentioned that you actually had access to model sixteens and stuff too. So I mean, you were. Mm -hmm. I like eight inch discs. Now, I, I guess one other question because you, you had a multi pack and all this kind of stuff. Did you also get into the BBS scene or was there a BBS scene in West Virginia at that time? Uh, no, the BBS scene I wasn't even aware of until uh, until I was in college. And even so, the that was something that was highly discouraged in the oh, really? family was tie yeah, was was tie was tying up the phone line like that. So okay. Because we only had the one phone line, and so if you're tying it up doing you know for with data stuff, that means that there are calls that may not be able to be made. And yeah, my solution was I just got a paper and paid for my own phone line, but <laughs> yeah. Now you you're mentioning that you did do a little bit of like time sharing with some of the systems that your parents had access to. Was that done through the phone line or did you actually go down and onto a terminal? No, that somewhere? was done through the phone line. That was, that was okay. done through the phone line. So you're allowed to do uh, some uh, stuff, just not a BBS thing. Yeah, it was, it was, uh, it was something that was like, it wasn't something that was always there. It was something that showed up one day and mom was like, here, look at this. And I'm like, Ooh, that's nifty. <laughs> and, and did you do any of the big uh, data um, hubs like CompuServe, Delphi, Genie, that kind of thing back in the day too? I, 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 Experienced CompuServe. Um, when I was uh, during my childhood, we didn't really spend that much time on it. It's so expensive for so yeah. little time, and, and know, twice as like, much in Canada. <laughs> right, and, and it's like the where we were at with things. Where we were at with things, it was along the lines of you practically had to know what was there and know exactly what were you what you were getting, you know, before you even logged on. Because by the time you got there, you'd already spent twenty bucks. And this yeah. is in nineteen. This is in nineteen eighties money. Yeah, yeah. Because we we always used to do. I used to do my calling anyway when I was doing it. Uh, I wasn't hacking into it, which I was doing at the very beginning. But uh, later on, when I was actually paying for it properly, I always went after midnight because it was like a sixty percent discount on the mm. the phone line charge because it was a long distance call. Plus, there was a Canadian data pack surcharge. Then the CompuServe charge itself is like twenty dollars an hour or something like that. It was just insane. If that's really bought. And thankfully, our nearest access point was uh, was local. So, yeah. well, you guys we actually weren't far from it. Columbus, Ohio, is I think where their headquarters was, if I remember correctly. No, nah, we weren't. We weren't far at all. And um, the question was along the lines of where was the uh, X.25 network? Where were the access points laid out? Yeah, because yeah. in that day and age, like, yeah, sure, I can call Huntington. I I was living in Huntington, and I could call Huntington, and that was local. And I could call Barbersville, and that was local. But uh, Hurricane was not. You know, as soon as I got past Hurricane, going out towards Charleston and some of the and some of the major ones, all of a sudden I'm having to pay in I'm having to pay in state long distance. Yeah, and it was more expensive to call, say, Charleston, West Virginia, from Huntington, West Virginia, than it was to call Los Angeles. <laughs> yeah, that's nuts. I, I the reason I asked is that um, given your your parents' background and also the fact there was a very active Coco forum on CompuServe. In mm. fact, some of the projects that Radio Shack was doing, not publicly known, had secret groups set up in the Cocoa Forum there for you know the collaborators, hardware and software collaborators to work on. So it was a very active community. Um, and then later on, Delphi kind of took it over after the you know the prices dropped and stuff. But I didn't know if you guys had been involved with that or not. 
No, the it's it was unfortunate because again you're looking at the economic opportunities of the region, you know, and what were what were we able to what were we be able to do, um, yeah. and so it wasn't something where we could do the online thing very you know very re with any type of reasonable um frequency but what we did do and what, what uh dad really enjoyed and i think was very helpful as far as my uh, science fair project was we were we were active with uh one of the local uh cocoa groups and i can't remember where that cocoa group was i think it was in huntington but it you know for all i know i could have run across i could have run across boat and aaron back in the day you know <laughs> Because we were at one of the same Coco groups. Yeah. But Boat for sure would not have been. He was way too young. Um, and he started with the Atari 8-bit machine. But Aaron, I'm trying to remember if he said if he even knew about a Coco users group in the area. I don't think he did. But yeah, I mean, the users groups, I mean, we had, we had a fairly good size one up here. But uh, that, that was a lifesaver. Because you, if you just bought the computer and you, you know somebody at Radio Shack told you, oh, by the way, there's this little club on the side here. You might want to contact this number type mm -hmm. thing. And and then you find out there's a whole third party world because Radio Shack was rather infamous for not letting people know that you know it's not just what we sell. There's a ton of other stuff you can get elsewhere, including stuff yep. we will never sell here. And yep. uh, and also just the knowledge of finding out about all the third party magazines, which had hardware projects, software projects, programming tutorials. And uh, if you're just kind of on your own, you had the basic manual and maybe the Discad Tasm manual or something, and that's pretty well you had. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I would, like you, I would like to find a copy of the uh, the bug monitor, the wolf bug there, because I do remember reading about it, but I don't remember. I think I've one of the guys found... in our club did have it way, way back, but I don't have a clue what happened to it. I've only ever found two references. Like, I've only, I, I, and it's almost like, okay, now we need to do an archaeological dig in upgraded uh, first edition Rev D board. <laughs> <laughs> and see if the see if the ROMs and those Rev D boards actually have Wolf Bug in them. Yeah. Do you remember? Was it a cartridge or was it a software off tape? Thing? No, it was an EPROM. It was in the it was in the EPROM. It was in the EPROM. Okay. It was in the EPROM. So I'm not uh, I'm not sure if the extended color basic that we got with that was a uh, was a Tandy product, as in like originally uh, original Tandy. Um, but Wolfbug was definitely part of the uh, EEPROM that was put in there. That'd be custom. I don't think Radio Shack ever ever sold yeah. that. So I have a I have a Rev D Coco one with 4K. Um, but but yeah, I don't know. I mean, Does yeah, it, my my Rev D Coco definitely did not. It just had a color basic 1.1, which I had upgraded right. from 1.0. Yeah, I think like, that's what mine has too. Drivers, and then extended basic 1.0. I kind of wonder if maybe instead of put, I want maybe if that code was dropped on the basic instead of the extended basic, because that could possibly, possibly avoid some legalities, especially if you like receive it and then send in the original ROM that you had. I suppose it's possible. I've never heard of anybody really doing that. Um, Microsoft was pretty strict from what I understand of making sure they were paid their royalty for their basic and you weren't supposed to tamper with it. <laughs> mm, okay. So a lot of people obviously did. Any further questions there, Mark, or anybody else in the panel? I don't think so, but if I miss somebody, please let me know. But uh, And Karen is in there, so if you want to put out the public request for some source code there, uh, feel free, Henry, because he's listening. <laughs> oh, yeah. This about your shirt. Here, uh, <laughs> smooth scrolling. I want to know how to do smooth scrolling. So there you go, Karen, your little smooth scrolling demo with some of the timing on the SAM and the VDG there. He would like to see some source to figure out how that works. <laughs> so I don't know if he was in, in the chat there before we asked it the first time. Ryan Weasel said there was a really nice interface in Hot Cocoa. It'll do exactly what he needs in a simple project. And Eric Rangel asked, has anyone interfaced an Arduino with the Cocoa? And yeah, kind of. I actually have some boards that Jason Lee Steer um, developed to put a um, one of the uh, PJB... Um, what are they? The uh, Teensy 3.5 or 3.6, which are not really an Arduino, but kind of an ARM type system. So yeah, Arduino could be done too, but there's actually boards to do, you know, larger processors also. Uh, Mark, I'm trying to remember what does Mr. Dave use for some of his projects? Like he's got those little USB interface stuff he's added. I'm trying to remember what he uses um, as a base for that. I know the one he wanted to do for expanding his game uh, uses an ESP32. 
because they had set up to do the Wi-Fi and uh, and use it for processing, offloading, and stuff. So you know, that's a, another uh, another platform that's not really Arduino, but very popular embedded system. Well, the the mouse boards that uh, both myself and David Ladd uh, did uh, used the Arduino, and I've seen some keyboard interfaces where the Arduino translate a, translates the PC keyboard to the uh, Cocoa Matrix. Uh, they're using the 328P Atmel, which is in the core of the Arduino uh, Uno. So, okay, Henry. Would you ever be yeah. uh, interested in using uh, a Coco VGA if they become uh, available again? I would be. I would definitely be interested in trying out the Co the Coco VGA. Um, that was like, because of your your <clears throat> your your wanting usually to do your own projects. That's something you'd like to build yourself, or is that yeah, something you'd be uh, willing to buy off the shelf? It's likely. It's like as not. It's something that um, I might I might be okay with buying it off the shelf, but I'd also like to be able to put it together myself. Um, things like the Coco VGA and Kieran's, um, Kieran's Sam project that he's doing, uh, where they, where it's been taken apart and put back together again. And there's a possibility to see, uh, see, okay, what's going with it and maybe go ahead and have an easier modification with that than I would with the original hardware. Okay. So I know John Whitworth, um, on the dragon side is actually working on now he's been, done his duplication of the dragon motherboard. I think he's on revision three or four, but now he's doing some stuff where he's basically doing the equivalent of a Coco VJ, but doing it fresh, clean, you know, right from the scratch, you know, building it himself, right. programming it himself, et cetera, but kind of doing some of the same thing. So I didn't know if that's the approach you would prefer to take because you do tend to be more of a tinkerer rather that's, than just off the shelf parts. Ultimately, that's the way that I ultimately that's the way that I want to go. Um, because all I'm not worried about getting the machine that I have right now um, working any better, any quicker. Uh, it's doing fine for what I, for what I'm using it for. If I, if I wind up in a situation where, oh, I've got this machine and I want it to work and I want it to work well right now, then sure, I'll go ahead and put some stuff in it like that. Okay. I think Ron, you alluded to earlier, you're wondering about uh, the origin of your shirt because it appears to be a Cocoa Boot screen with a. Oh yeah, it's pretty close to it. Um, inverse colors, um, color set zero. <laughs> and what I was doing, what I was doing is like. I'm looking at the OK prompt and I'm like, this has this has pun written all over it if I can figure <laughs> out the pun. Mm -hmm. So I figured out the pun. It was a good work. So, yeah. 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 Is that is that your plan boot screen for the fourth implementation you're doing too? No, no. Although I could possibly use it. There's there's any I mean, if I want to waste bit if I want to waste bytes, then I could probably find a whole bunch of mod D's that end with OK and have it be working with that. <laughs> Okay. I, I don't have any other questions myself. Um, I definitely am following your channel and obviously you're on the show to talk about it whenever we get to. And uh, you've got a lot of interesting projects going. Like fourth is a language I just never could wrap my head fully around. Though I do know some people that swear by it. And that's why some people actually bought the Jupiter Ace, which is an incredibly rare machine, but that was the built-in language of that particular one. I don't know if you've had any experience with the Ace or not. But... No, I've heard of it, but that... But Spin-off from Sinclair's. Spin -off yeah, from it's, the Sinclair. a, it's a Z80 based fourth machine if i remember correctly yeah. or was it 6502 i can't remember mark no it's uh mm. the engineers that did it were a spinoff from sinclair so they basically took the idea behind the zx80 zx8081 and made the jupiter ace but used fourth instead of basic but basically yeah. the same hardware henry did you use um you know a fifth library or do you know uh use utility programs or um like I, I know that you're limited to what you can do off of the, uh, you know, your server, like, you know, because you don't have a SDC, but um, have you ever explored some of those programs, you know, just to see how they worked and, you know, like Telewriter? Oh, no, I haven't really done much. The only utility program that I've ever used on the Cocoa is scripts it. Yeah, you're not even familiar with uh, um, what was that one? Um, um yeah there was a couple of uh utility programs that were so useful um i can't think of a one right now but do you know the one with the color bars that would cycle um you know it was reverse video when you loaded in um 
Are you thinking Jeff Francis' yeah, disc Francis, utility? Exactly. Yeah. There was two versions, one for the two and later on for the three. Yeah. And that no, did, we never I never did know, uh, I never did use the disc utility. Yeah, that did um, um that worked with, you know, a fl floppy drive which you didn't have, but um, mm -hmm. What was nice about it was you could read through text files and, you know, it's a, a, a true utility. You know, you could actually see how the disk drive is laid out. and There's mm. lots of functions in it. Did you, you ever yeah. use it, uh, Curtis? Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. 2.1 or whatever the, the common yeah. Cocoa 1 and 2 one was. I know, actually, yeah, you mentioned that, of course, you use Wolfbug, which is a monitor and a you know hex mm. dumper so that are... Uh, for, for programming an assembly language, which you mentioned that you did do even as a kid, did you actually have an assembler? Did you get EdTASM on a cartridge or disk or one of the third-party ones? I, I I believe that what I wound up doing was hand assembling because I don't uh, either that or Wolfbug assembled for me. Um, okay. I don't believe that I had an assembler available. Yeah, because I'm imagining if you had EdTASM, you would remember like ZBug is a you know, a bug yeah. monitor type thing that's built into it. you control software. Yeah, no, the only thing the only thing that I remember playing with was Wolfbug. So I had to have I had to have hand assembled that stuff. Okay. I did it's that at the beginning too. And then you know the cartridge version, because I was starting to switch to disk ready, I had to patch the living crap out of get a run off disk. But at some which, point you know Nick still uses to this day. <laughs> did you realize that there was the T1 ship um, you know, as you were using the Coco twos? Um not until I got back into it. Not until I got back into it a, few, a couple, three years ago. Yeah, because lowercase was present then. No. Yeah, yeah. What you mentioned, you want to use the uh, the the adaptive, you know, the one pin that you can enable an external ROM, yeah. so you can create your own. Yeah. Either a Pull custom set or lowercase. Set bit six free. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which I believe John's also implementing on his. So he's going to have a reprogrammable, so a, like a flash mm -hmm. ROM or something, so you can actually yeah, just change that. the character set. But uh, Dennis Bathory Kitts, who's the uh, host of the uh, Cocoa Listserv, he he used to sell the lower kit. That was one of his big big things he used to sell through uh, Green Mountain Micro. Mm -hmm. And he had the uh, font not only with lowercase, but he expanded the fonts so with more fill to sell with all all the green space around, so the characters yep. were bigger and bolder. Yep. I remember seeing that somewhere. I can't remember where. But the big thing that I was looking at with that with uh, having an external character set is now. Uh, semi-graphics becomes more than just semi-graphics. Now you've got the possibility to actually do Petsky. Um, <coughs> yep. And then if you can do Petsky, now the Coco can join the Petsky robots cadre. Uh, well, we started that, just haven't finished it yet. That's using graphic screens <laughs> and it's Coco 3 only, but... But yeah, we we started that project a while ago. It's, it's actually kind of running now, but uh, hmm. both of us got busy with other projects and haven't bothered to finish it yet. One of these days, I got to reorganize the memory map on it. Though the way we set it up is is just not going to work. Henry, have you, have you ever had the experience of using any of the clones, like uh, you know Dragon or any of the other machines that you know? No, I TD three hundred. I hadn't. I hadn't. Ha haven't had that. Uh, haven't had that experience. I have a vague recollection. Of seeing the uh, of seeing the dragon being uh, the dragon under its American branding, I think Tano is the American yeah. branding, if I recall correctly. Um, I remember seeing that in the U.S. Uh, or seeing that on TV, and not necessarily being impressed because, in the immortal words of the French guards, "I've already got one, oui, oui, and it's a very nice." I think the main selling point for it in North America was that it came with a built-in real parallel port, which most printers were, and the fact that it had a really decent keyboard, the same one that the Mark Data Products keyboard. Yep, nice keyboard. So yep. that, that was really nice to type on. Yeah, I can um, see those being And sold. a real serial port, too. 65. That was a 64, though. The 32 did not have the real serial port. Oh, the Dragon, yeah. So I was thinking of the Tano. Now, I was going to ask you, that you, you don't remember too many details about the user group here, but how big was it, and was it filled with people that actually were the hardware software types or was it more of a piracy ring like some music groups tended to be it was or... it was a mix of both i mean i do remember that uh i do remember that there was so there was software to be had um and there were a lot of people who were showing off like hardware mods and things of that nature so it was relative it was relatively large and i was little at the time i mean i couldn't have been more than a, like nine eight or nine years old when i when i experienced this first experienced this and it just seemed 
like massive. There were probably about a hundred people there or something like that. Oh, that's a good size, especially for yeah. West Virginia. Yeah. yeah. And was was uh, your dad well, actively I'm, involved in the club as well, or was that just you? Uh, I think it was, it was dad. It was dad. So he heard about it. He went to it. And I'm imagining that that was like uh, kind of a regional thing because Huntington's kind of like the urban center of the tri-state area. So it, it draws in from just over the river in, in Ashland, just over the river in like Chillicothe, Ohio, and places like that. So you've got a relatively sizable swath of area that Huntington will draw in. I'm but, trying to remember um, Chillicothe actually had one of the Cocoa software developers that advertised in Rainbow. And I can't remember which one it is. Like one of the companies that sold at least software. At least I think it was Chillicothe. Um, I might be thinking of no, I'm, I'm not Chillicothe, Chesapeake, Ohio. Chesapeake, Ohio. Oh, okay. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. That's the one that's right across the river, along with Ironton. Um, but yeah, that that whole that whole region just kind of centers around Huntington. And then if you go south along the West Virginia, Kentucky border you wind up pulling almost a full hour down and you can pull people up into Huntington from there because there's almost literally nothing um, until you get up to Huntington. Well, where yeah. was Falstaff at? It was in Kentucky, Falstaff? Right? Um, Rainbow. They were based in Kentucky. Falstaff, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, they're in oh. Kentucky. Yeah, they're just northeast of Louisville, I think, um, the yeah. suburb called. blanket on it but louisville kentucky area yeah yeah <laughs> I, lived in I, was, I was in toledo when i first was using the um cocoa and we had probably 80 or 110 people in our uh, color computer group and we met every month and it was mm. you know awesome for getting programs and learning you know especially um learning the basic and you know, we always had a couple of real smart guys, which didn't include me, that did uh, mm -hmm. presentations all the time. You know, they would demo software, and and um, we just loved it. It was, you know, it just it was self-perpetuating. I mean, you, you couldn't wait to come to the next meeting to, to learn stuff. Yeah, I don't know about this getting programs things. We just had a guy that was selling used discs. <laughs> Did, did the club though in your area last erased? fairly long, Henry? Or see, I'm not sure because I only remember going the once. I think Dad went more uh, more frequently. Okay. Um, but I really only remember I, I only remember the once. That doesn't mean that I didn't go more frequently. It just means that I, that's all I remember. Okay. Go but ahead, Mark. You had a question or statement? Oh, just uh, Mark B was talking about sold used discs, and they said ones that weren't erased. Oh, they're very popular too. <laughs> I can imagine. And I think my my final question is like your your current videos are kind of set as you've picked a project and you just decide to record yourself doing it. You have some mm -hmm. humorous bits. You show your mistakes. Sometimes you fast forward them type thing. Um, do you plan on expanding that to actually doing like say more lengthy tutorials or something to show people how to do certain things or program a certain thing type thing? Or do you want to stick that's more with like, the? That's one of my that's one of my hopes um in in that i should be i should be able to do that at the same time it's like there's this there's this whole thing that i kind of enjoy about the yeah come along come with me you know we're go, we're going to go through this together and you know when i stumble and fall you're going to help pick me up yeah because you and kogotan have a, have a commonality that way because he likes showing his mistakes too and you know it's not meant to be a tutorial or a nice you know tied in a bow here's how you you know build this type thing it's like I thought I tried to build this and then halfway through I decided I had to switch it to do something else. And then, you know, you get to, you get the whole flow of creativity, you know, the good and the bad type thing. And I, I personally, I prefer that because that's more like real life. I always feel, you know, like I'm just crappy at programming or something. If I watch somebody like do a start to finish half hour video and he's written an operating system type thing. Because you know? <laughs> he only shows you every, all of every success, you know, and you think he's perfect yeah. type thing. And I, I prefer the more... I, Organic. I could do that, but then I wouldn't have. <laughs> but then I wouldn't have a video out for six months. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but it's interesting, it's interesting to hear that you actually are thinking about doing tutorials because that's something that, uh, especially when people start, you know, getting into the cocoa. We're getting more and more people coming into the cocoa these days, which is great. Mm -hmm. But a lot of them are trying to, you know, search YouTube or search the web, trying to find, you know, I need to build this cable or I need to do some more simpler mm -hmm. things 
And having an actual tutorial that can do it very concisely is is not a bad idea, though it's also beneficial, I think, to do the, you know, where you're kind of figuring out mistakes and what common batfalls yeah. are type thing. You got a great Today voice, we're going to. <laughs> What's that? You got a great voice. Oh, thank you. I appreciate I that. Mean, you, you know, it's like broadcast type voice, which, you know, uh, makes me wonder if you've ever thought about doing commercials, like kind of like what had um, what the Coco Crew does. Or have you ever heard their show and how they have commercials between that are retro having to do with the cocoa and stuff i've heard their i've heard the commercials that they've done i've wondered if they were the ones who produced those or not but um i've yes. done i've done announcing before i've done some i've done some public speaking before and you know actually doing that uh, actually doing that as part of my uh, part of a paid job well every so often i have to give a sermon and Part of the uh, part of the job that I have is training our guys how to how to tell people their stories and how to tell the people their, their stories from a stage. So I get practice in that, and I'm you know I teach them from that regard. But and you mentioned before, I'm, like you you do video production with your job. Does that involve you getting in front of the camera too, or is that more recording other stuff and creating usually. a video? Yeah, not usually. It usually involves me. It usually involves me being behind the camera um, and dealing with not necessarily unwilling people, but people who have never been in front of a camera before. Oh, I'll be fine. I've given my I've given my uh, my I've given my testimony in front of thousands of people before. It's like, OK, have you ever been in front of a camera? No, I haven't. But it should be. I can't. I, 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 <laughs> need, need a little coaching. <laughs> It's like yeah. the camera scares people who haven't yeah. been in front of it before. <laughs> yeah, it's a bit intimidating, I have to say. Not not like this little junior pikey thing with you know a built-in yeah. webcam, but I'm talking like real in front of real cameras. Yeah, it's a bit intimidating. Well, even mine, it's just like a pair of lumices that I'm using, and it's still like it intimidates people. I think it's that unblinking eye. <laughs> yeah. Maybe if I could put a red LED in the middle of it hmm, and get it to start talking. <laughs> Yeah, and have a Hell 9000 voice. <laughs> Hello, Dave. I'm afraid I can't. Are you sure that. you want to solder that? <laughs> That's all the questions I have. I do have one from Eric Rangel in the chat here. I think he must have joined Lake. He says, so is Henry working on a version of Force for the Coco? Yes, he is. Yes. It's its own operating system. <laughs> yeah. And was uh, Mark, Hal was there anything else I missed uh, in the last few minutes? In the chat i don't think so i might have missed something there's quite a bit of chatter here but i think i picked them all up so and again this is your chance if you ask a question and we haven't answered it shout it out again yep yeah, so I've, I've pretty well exhausted my questions uh, but i definitely want to thank henry for uh, agreeing agreeing to be our uh, interviewee guinea pig. guinea pig or whatever you want to call it um but uh, definitely uh, uh for those that uh, are just new to finding about out about you during this interview here um do you have a separate website or you just have the YouTube channel at this point? Right now, just the YouTube channel. Um, however, I do have the breakkey.com. Uh, I, I do have that registered, but I don't have anything on it. So I don't know that I've got that listed in the about page. So for right now, it's just the YouTube. Okay. And to find you on the YouTube channel, did you just search for the break key? I'm presuming that's pretty unique. Yep. <laughs> And of course, we'll be covering his videos on the news here as they come out. So uh, if you're catching our show regularly, you should be kept up to date. And of course, Henry has become a regular guest on our show. So he can tell you about that kind of stuff as well. And I'm not seeing any new questions coming in. Anybody on the panel, some last questions before we continue on with the rest of the show? So sometime you will be purchasing a Coco 3 down the road, do you think? I would imagine so. I've I've been keeping my eyes open for it. Um, the two things that I I actually the two things that I want to get are like the uh, are are the uh, LP the uh, Line Printer Seven and possibly Coco Three. I'm thinking that I'm going to wait until Coco Fest to really see like okay, do I grab one or not? Yeah, you'll get a good you know wide range of both hardware and software for it. Yeah. So. Why 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 Line Printer Seven? Nostalgia. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, that's what he grew up with. Well, I have one in a box. So maybe I should bring it. Hey, there you go. There you go. 
Yeah. Because you're coming down this year again, Ron, yeah. aren't you? Okay. That's the plan, yeah. I haven't been to Chicago in ages. Yeah, that's why if I'm Ron's coming down Portugal. anyway, if I mean if you if you have the LP seven, if you wanna part with it. I just have to you know make sure I don't owe I'm gonna bring some software I have too to sell at the show. You know, I have a whole bunch of uh, you know, uh what do you call it? Repeats, you know, or duplicates. No, yeah. More duplicates, yeah. So I'm bringing that and then um I just have to make room, you know, it's tough. You're flying. So Okay. Well, thanks again, Henry, for being our official guest. Uh, of course, you'll be staying on the show as long as you want, as you usually do. <laughs> and uh, I, I definitely have been uh, appreciative of you coming onto the Game On Challenge lives on Thursdays as well, even though, as you've admitted today, you're not really a gamer. Mm. But uh, it's it's been fun having you there with hey, some of the, the wisecracking, etc. <laughs> there we go. And I if you can influence Ken to pick better recovery. games, please do. <laughs> Never. <laughs> Ready for I swear commercial? I will show up and I will play Color Scripts it. I just don't know how to score it. <laughs> well, if you need tips on Dagger, I thought a few of us have won that game, so we can help you with that too. So, hmm. Okay, I think that's it for the interview, so thanks again. Uh, Mark, did you want to go for a commercial break before we come on for the Game On Challenge? Yes. Hey, It's your good buddy, your good pal, Amigo, and joined by that dastardly The Brent from ARG Presents. You're watching Coco Nation. I feel like that should have been longer. The Coco Nation Show would like to thank the following patrons. Alex Gare, Brendan Donahue, Brian Walsh, Brian Weasler, Karen Anscombe, Coconut Bob, Daddy Burrito, Derek Smithson, Diego BF109, Don Barber, Eric Canales, Glenn Hewlett, Graham Wabke, Grant Leedy, Henry Strickland, Justin Larson, Ken Reichert, Kevin Holloway, Paul Fiscarelli, Paul Shoemaker, R. Allen Murphy, Retro Tech Time, Rob Inman, Rocky Hill, Steve Batson, TJB Chris, Tom C, Tom Gunderson, Tom S, and William Athing. Thank you so much, patrons. Welcome to everybody's favorite segment, Who's New to Discord? John KJ5JDM says, Hello. My love for the Coco began when I was a sophomore in high school. I bought a 16K Coco 1 with extended basic. Later I bought hard drives, multi-pack expansion unit, a Coco 2, OS 9. It was awesome, but then moved to the Commodore Amiga and then PCs. I recently bought a Coco 2 at a garage sale that sparked that love again. James I says, hey everyone. I've got fond memories of the Coco. My first Coco was a F-board Coco 1 that I upgraded to 64K myself. I still have a Coco 2B with a 6747T1 VDG, a Coco 3, and a Dragon 64. I was the manager of Delmer Company when the Coco 3 came out. I wish I had bought one of Ed Gressick's PT68 K4 based system for computers. I was the one that suggested that Ed port G Windows to that system. I also suggested that Ed use that Sang Lab ET4000 VGA video card. Sylvain C says, Hello, Sylvain, from France. I love hack spirit and retro gaming stuffs, looking for some good exchanges and specially around CocoPie channel. The main systems I am using, MVS, Atomus Wave and Recal Box. I just start my electronic journey and try to learn step by step about electronics, soldering, 
mod stuffs, etc. The previous bios were edited for time. Thanks to, Boysen, Glenside Computer Club, Paul Fiscarelli, Tandy Color Computer 3, and the Coco Nation patrons for boosting the server. Please consider joining Discord and visiting the welcome section to read these bios in full and see what the community has to offer. Just go to discord.thecoconation.com. See you on Discord! And we're back. And before we go to the high score challenge, I've got to know, Bob, how are things going? Uh, things are going great here. Um, let's see, I've, I've got a Coco 3 set up here. So I have actually finished assembling my keyboard. I stay finished. Obviously, there's some labeling issues. Oh, so that's uh, a smoke test. I made this with an extra long cord so that I can, yeah, I can use this with, uh, you know, for if I have a board sitting on the bench and I can't just set a keyboard on top of it because they put such short cords on them. So this is like a diagnostic keyboard. Let me plug this in. Come on. And these PC boards are just a little bit thicker than the sockets like to accept, but they do work. All right. So with, some, with a little over. persuasion, huh? Yeah. All right. So arrow keys. Ah, good choice. Yeah. <laughs> My favorite folder. <laughs> I tell you what, Nick, I start every day with just about every day with a game of Joey or uh, Space Intruders. <laughs> so I usually. Uh, let's just... <laughs> wow, Nick, that must have cost you a bit for that review. <laughs> that product placement. All the keys work. And I don't know if you guys can hear this keyboard but it sounds nice well i'm not hearing it no nope, not hearing it here either no well i'm thinking my headset is noise canceling it out <laughs> um let me see and there was a comment in the chat the reason why uh, bob's screen is small like that is because uh, his uh, bandwidth is a bit limited at the moment so zoom mm -hmm. automatically reduces the size to keep up with what is available Yep, I definitely have bandwidth issues. I'm actually streaming over my uh, cell phone hotspot. Wow, that's that's I, impressive. I Usually those don't yeah. aren't so great. <laughs> yeah, well, apparently it works better than the library hotspot. <laughs> <laughs> the old public Wi-Fi. Yeah, basically. I mean, they actually check out hotspots that you can take home at the Dallas library. So that's what we use for home internet here. Oh, cool. There's just, there are no service providers at this location yet. But anyway, uh, as you can see, this keyboard fits in the case in the exact uh, stock. Actually, we just see your Coco screen at the moment. So maybe switch the camera. Oh, yeah, maybe that wouldn't make sense. <laughs> as you can't see. Yeah. So this is uh, literally sitting on the original pegs um, for the keyboard. So was that Those, a kit, or is that something of your own design? Uh, the board was designed by Mr. Dave. I just mentioned in the uh, buy, sell, trade chat that I was looking for some keyboards, and he said he had some bare circuit boards that he designed. These are the color computer, basically a drop-in replacement. It's got our wiring uh, matrix. So, uh, so the board is the frame. Pin. Basically, the board is the frame. What it doesn't have is like a spacer. So if I set a lid on here, there's basically a bit of a gap at the top. And Okay, which is a, which would have been the thickness really. of the original uh, frame that, that came on the original keyboard. Right. Looks like okay. it's in the vicinity of a half inch. And maybe the keyboard could sit up a little higher, but but regardless, it just I mean it it yeah, feels probably some very peg similar. Extender. Peg extenders yeah. is probably all you need. And just a little washers under the pegs. 
Yeah. But it feels very nice. It almost feels like an original uh, Coco 3 keyboard. Got that kind of soft feel to it. Um, I used cream keys for these, uh, MMD brand, I think. Uh, but the cream keys seem to be very popular for people who like silent keyboards. Fairly quiet. Just out of curiosity, nice. for those who are interested in doing this product themselves to replace a keyboard, what does it cost to get that board and then all the keys? Um, the board is, I mean, I, uh, it's kind of hard to say. I think I spent like 25 bucks and I got two of these keyboards and a couple of the little uh, the keyboard plug-in adapters. And he threw in like some ROM pack adapters and stuff, so... I don't know exactly that uh, the board cost, but the the keys themselves. I mean, there's a pretty wide range you can pay for those too, depending on how long you're willing to wait. If you order from um, AliExpress, you can get a lot, probably half the price of ordering off of Amazon. So, what would that price range be? That I'm just kind of curious. So, from what I've seen. You're looking at about twenty to thirty dollars for a seventy pack of keys, and seventy gives you enough to fill out the board plus maybe ten extras. Um, most of them offer like a thirty-five pack or a forty-five pack, and you have to buy multiples. Some of them offer you know different size packages from ten, thirty. 70, 110, you know, however many you need. So I almost thought about getting a, a one big enough to do both keyboards, but I wanted to try some different keys. Okay. So these what are these the were keys? relatively cheap. Hmm? What, what are the keys to the left of the space bar? Uh, the keys, are, uh, this is Alt and Control, yeah. F1 and F2. And then he's got some blank uh, spaces down here where you could put a switch that will actually change the function of a couple of keys. So this labeled page up and page down is actually an up and down arrow. And he moved the control and alt down here. But we still have all four arrows on the right side as usual. Right. So Does he do any combo keys too? Like I know like page up and page down in, in OS 9 is usually a shift up, shift down. It's used for a fair number of text viewers and editors and stuff. I was wondering, does he have that kind of design in there or does he just have like duplicates uh, so that you can say get arrow keys on both sides of the keyboard, for example? I think it's uh, mainly there's like the duplicate key function, but there's also something labeled in here where you can have like an alternate fire button, which is kind of interesting. So you could use it like a keyboard for a fire button if you have a that makes sense. It's tied in the PA button. in the same spot. That's where the old basic used to have that bug where you hit the fire button and a string of eight characters would suddenly shoot out yeah. in basic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because the this joystick is... button is kind of part of sort of part of the keyboard matrix. Yeah. Yeah. I want to hurry up and ask you before uh, Henry does was why isn't there a red escape key or break key? <laughs> yeah, I was, I was thinking because yeah, I ordered the wrong keycap. <laughs> but on the <laughs> On the next the set other, of keycaps, there there will be a red brake key. The other thing, the other thing that I wonder about, aside from just like the lack of a red brake key, is um, I know they're like unobtainium, but is there a way to get keycaps? Uh, I mean, DS or S uh, spherical keycaps, MT three, whatever, with the with the teletype with the teletype legends on them, such as the Coco has, like the Shift two is the uh, is the open quote, and the Shift seven is the single quote. Etc. Do do those even right. exist? I have never seen them, but you can get blank keycaps and uh, laser etch them yourself. Yeah, that's what Ed Snyder did with his Coco Mac keyboard. They lasered his own. That's what the one I yeah. have, which has all the Coco keycaps and and some extended what ones for I'm, Nitrous Nine. Yeah, what I'm planning to do on this is I actually have some uh, laser printable. Uh, they're they're actually wire labels, but I can cut out little tiny strips of it with labels and it, it it's very thin plastic and they'll stick over that and not be too obtrusive for, for a, you know, for a diagnostic keyboard for external use, that's fine. 
because the layout is a bit different. Like above the two is an at symbol. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's yeah. just your standard ad ANSI layout. Yeah. Again, that's pretty I much mean, all they sell. It's either ANSI or it's blank. So I mean, you, interesting, you fun little fact on, here. Uh... Yeah, fun little fact here that I that I noticed. Um, one might wonder why, and uh, I'm I'm one might wonder why were those there in the first place, where we had the quotes over the shit over the two, the uh, the a hyphen over the seven. Um, interesting little fact: if you look at the ASCII codes, and I would imagine also the teletype codes for those for those uh, for those figures, it's a it's a simple addition of 16 or hex 10 yeah, to get from bit. or sub, simple sub, uh, a subtraction of 16 or 10 to get from the numbers to the symbols that are above them. So, yeah, speaking of teletype keyboards, I'm not sure, but I think that's what this came out of. This was oh, my nice. very first quotes over the built. two on that one. Yep. This was hand <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> that that yes. looks painful. <laughs> it was. And you have so a numeric keypad on that one as well, which is something I remember some of the people in the club doing back in the day with the Model 3 keyboard on the Coco. Right. So one of the things I thought about doing with this that I have not uh, done, and I did see this uh, written up in probably Rainbow or something, but like for the, the star key is a shifted key, and there was a little transistor circuit that you could put in here so that you could hit it, and it would pop out an asterisk instead of a colon. Yeah, that's what I was asking about earlier if he was doing any combo key type things because I've seen that done before but too. No, yeah. That's not uh, on this board, but it, it could be, you know, you could put that underneath it if you needed that. But yeah, the number keys work, the arrow keys up here. I did my inverted T because I like gaming. Um, function keys, everything's pretty much, I actually... I have my control and all on the right side and my function keys on the left. Got an at key over here. It's funny you mentioned that you have the inverted T for your, cause you like gaming. Cause I'm still very partial, especially on Coco games of the up and down and left and right arrow keys being on opposite sides of the keyboard. So I can two hand it instead of trying to cram all my fingers mm -hmm. over one little spot. That's all right. I've never been a fan of having my, uh, controls separated between hands. Um, like when I on on PC gaming in particular, I would I would use my mouse for aiming and my left hand on uh, like WASD for moving. Yeah, well, yeah, it makes much more sense in modern games. But I know some of the games like Sea Dragon and Famsa are just play so much easier with the separated keys, which is why mm -hmm. Rick's got that built-in switch where you can flick it so that Control and Alt on the Coco Three keyboard becomes an up and down arrow. And I think that these are Alps keys, so they're a little trickier to find, but this is a really nice keyboard to type on, too. Uh, this was originally built for my repack. Yeah, it was that tower case you had the Coco repacked in, right? Yeah. Yep. And I am in the process. I found a place that sells nice pieces of wood. So I'm going to get some wood and make a little keyboard case for this and probably a nice panel for this. So what are your, what is your current count for uh, how many Cocos do you have? Okay, so I've got my original Coco one. I've got a white case 64K Coco one. I have, I no longer have a Coco two because I sold that to Thomas Cherry Holmes, but I do have his here that I'm actually still working on the composite video of. Um, but I, uh, Coco threes, I have one, two, three, four. I think I have four including one in the box with a warranty sticker on it that doesn't work, plus two Athena boards that I've built. Currently, only one of those is working. So. Cool. Well, it looks like you got a lot uh, done there during uh, your stream. So getting the, uh, yeah, getting the keyboards, in particular for the Athena boards, you got to have a, a keyboard, you know, so. 
can't just take it out of another color computer. <laughs> so how do you keep track which computer has which mod in it? <laughs> do you write it on the bottom or? Well, I've actually only got two of them that are really modded. Um, I've got this machine, which is my 3P, and it's pretty much got every mod I've ever wanted, almost, including, I don't know, you can't see it there because my stupid head is in the way. Okay. So this one has a little built-in audio amplifier. It's like a one-watt amp and a speaker. And just last weekend, I installed the volume control over here on the side. And that actually switches the amp on and off, too. It's got the, like an old No, you wanted your warranty there. Oh, <laughs> man. Yeah, well. Many times over. Mm -hmm. Okay. But then this one also has the RGB to HDMI built in. It's got the LEDs. It's got a pepper board. Nice 512K. And I am also working on... You might notice this guy sitting here. Look familiar? Keyboard extender and what? That. Magnetic socket. So basically my my old teletype keyboard there is going to get this magnetic socket next. And this just literally... It's in the bottom of the case here. I didn't even glue it in because it's a nice little press fit. The hole that I cut for it. And this is a 20 pin connector. So I've got the six pins, uh, the 16 pins for the keyboard plus a few extra wires for LEDs to put in the keyboard too. So I can have a uh, power LED, turbo LED, and a reset switch all on the keyboard. Cool. Now, Bob, are you are you making it to uh, Cocoa Fest this year too? Yes, I have reserved a table. Yeah, it'll be cool to see some of this stuff up uh, up close and personal. Mm -hmm. And I think I will be handing out LED uh, boards to anybody who wants one. So, ooh, free swag! Next to mess. Yep. <laughs> the whole reason we go to these things isn't it yep i hand out static bags and small screwdrivers mainly because yeah. i have lots lots of and lots of small screwdrivers <laughs> <laughs> lots and lots and i'll tell you later yeah. the story behind that you know, we <laughs> seem, seem to have lost everyone north of the mason dixon line until canada hmm you notice that Probably, yeah, I wonder if there's an internet outage or something because Rick usually sticks around for the whole show. Well, we lost Rick and then um, the, um, the guy in Omaha. Um, You're in Omaha? No. Not, not Omaha. David, but uh, his neighbor. Oh, Brand. yeah, Kevin. Ken. Kevin. Ken. Yeah. yeah, Kevin. No, I'm still here. <laughs> yeah, so am I. Yeah, Kevin no, Holloway, I think too. you're talking. Kevin. Yeah, Kevin yeah. Holloway. Yeah. And then Grant was on here, and he's gone. And Terry was on here, and he's gone. They're all sometimes just afraid they just get busy. Of my, they're oh, afraid of my is. next pick for the uh, game There's on Kevin. challenge. Hey, no, it's your shirt, Ken. We just we weren't going to tell you, but it's your shirt. <laughs> <laughs> it's burning everybody's retinas. <laughs> yeah, so you thought the green screen was bad, huh? Lovely shade of violet, it is. So, so do we have any other project updates and acquisitions? Not for me. Nope. Okay. Ken, you ready? Uh, sure. Welcome everybody to the Coco Nation Game On Challenge of the Week results video. This week we played Buried Bucks. We had a total of 11 players. 
We had Mr. Dave 6309 with 1811, Buck Owens with 1998, L. Curtis Boyle with 7161, Canadian Retro Things with 11195, Sloopy Malibu with 12982, Sabhead with 16038, Jim Rye with 16362, Coconut Bob 18093, Shenley, 19450, Nerf Herder, 27423, and this week's number one score belongs to Tasman with 31,749. Thanks, everybody that played. We'll see you again next week. Yay, Tasman! Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's your new intro for Tasman, is it? <laughs> All right, so Buried Bucks. I did find a couple of reviews for this game. Um, there we go. This one is from... Oh, where the heck is it from? The Gamers Connection. I was actually a little surprised that this game actually came out in 1988. And it is actually something they say in this um, article here, basically saying it's not an easy game. No. And one of the shortcomings of it is the graphics. Uh, to achieve the level of speed that the game runs at, they used P-Mode 4 of the earlier Cocos. So it looks like it was written in the early days of the Coco. But it was actually written well into the Coco 3's lifetime. Yeah, I mean, some people wanted to sell. To, I mean, there was a lot more Coco Twos out out there in the wild than there was Coco Threes by yeah. you know, several fact you know, multipliers. So it makes sense that they would try to hit a wider audience. But I think a lot of the Coco One and Two people just kind of had them hanging around. They didn't really buy that much new stuff, where that kind of backfired for a few people. I think. Well, this reviewer thought that the game was. Um... Not a great looker, but one of the fastest paced games they'd seen outside of an arcade. So um, I don't know if that would be something I would say, but it was definitely a very fast paced game. Yeah. And the other article that I found was in the Rainbow. And like most Rainbow game, most uh, Rainbow uh reviews of the later times here it's basically just a rehashing of the instruction book <laughs> and uh although something they mentioned in it that i did not realize because i never read the instructions is that you lose 10 points every time you fire so kind of the uh way that some people were playing by firing a whole bunch of times you're just losing points doing that yeah because the um, game wasn't hard enough so yeah but basically, they say that Buried Bucks is a lot of fun to play, and it's a simple theme, but challenging your skills to play the game. So I guess they kind of liked it as well. So both fairly positive reviews of this, this game. And uh, yeah. I'm interested, Ken, what, what is your review of the game? I didn't mind it. I thought it was a very unique game. And uh, a little bit hard, but I was getting a little better at it after the time. Probably not one I'm going to revisit a whole lot, but I probably will play it again. Myself, um, and this is something suffered by both games this week, is that the controls are the biggest downfall. The game concept is great. Um, and like you I said, the gameplay is pretty good. It just the having to steer the helicopter to get it centered to fire down, otherwise it firing off at angles and stuff on you. Like I, you ended up, you know, wasting ammo. And as you mentioned just now, you lose ten points every time you, you know, throw a bomb diagonally because you were trying to shoot it straight up and down type thing. So it was a little awkward to get the copter facing directly down. So and those stupid missiles will just randomly appear and shoot up and kill you. It wasn't a big. So that that, like. that sounds like a person that. Probably did not play a lot of Choplifter. Oh, no, I played Choplifter a lot. Because you, you didn't have, like, invisible thing. missiles suddenly shoot out of the ground to kill you. No, but you still had to maneuver the the uh, chopper to be sideways to... Yeah, um, but it just didn't feel the same. Like, Choplifter's is a lot smoother. It's a lot easier to get centered to go straight up and down versus the angle. I'd, I'd, 
I don't know how to explain it. I mean, I've only played Choplifter on the Apple II Plus, but yeah, I guess uh, because you couldn't just jab the joystick all the way over to the side to turn, you had to just kind of use a little bit of finesse. So, yeah, I know Paul Thayer is a game designer himself, and the Coco popped into the uh, chat there and was saying, "Yeah, it doesn't look very fair with the missiles just shooting randomly from the ground or underground." Yeah. You kind of get to uh, know that. Uh, one thing that I did see in one of the reviews is that um, the number of uh, dollar signs that are on the screen is the same number of hidden missiles that are in the ground. Oh, so, I didn't know that. That's cool. Yeah. Um, it's just a, I guess it's just kind of a, a, a way to uh, keep you from doing the whole thing where you because one of the tricks, of course, is to get right over top, very close to the ground, and then start rapid firing down and digging your hole. It's the yeah. quickest way to do it, but it's also the fastest way to get hit by one of those rockets. So, yeah, no, I have to agree. Like, one thing I know Nick and Paul have both said during interviews about game development is you have to balance the game to mm -hmm. make it a great one uh, for the player. And this is one I think is a little bit too balanced on the, the hard side. Control wise, some wipe, and then also like the, the missile thing, and that, you know both games this week I think suffered from that that problem. Yeah, it's the UK method of thinking of games. I guess <laughs> basically, <laughs> we're out here to murder the player. That's the only purpose of this game. Yep, it's uh, trying to eat all your quarters, except that they don't realize that uh, a lot of us have those Canadian uh, cocos that you can't stick quarters into. Yeah, not even a loony fits so. <laughs> Other than that, the game concept was good, and uh, yeah. you know the gameplay. Other than the controls, really, um, that's about the only real beef I had. The, the missiles is a bit unfair. It'd be better if there was some sort of a yeah. hint, and like maybe I a didn't... half second, you know, launch time where it just shows up, and then you at least have time to get out of the way or yeah. try to. I didn't find the controls nearly as frustrating as you did. So, um, but Henry, did you try this one? No, I did not. Lucky you. I mean, that's too bad. <laughs> did anybody else on the panel try this game? Come on, that professional player, Mark B. Uh, no. <laughs> Nick Marantes, you're the expert gamer here. So, what was your thoughts? Uh, I never looked at it. How easy would it have been to uh, Photoshop a score onto this, Nick? <laughs> They're all easy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, oh yeah, another thing that uh, was a complaint that's in the that Sloopy had and is in the um, the chat right now is the uneven frame rate. How oh, is that Tricub? Is that Sloopy? Nope, I don't know who that is. Okay. No, yeah, because he said re the same... reburied box. I played it, but the uneven frame rate kept throwing me off. Yeah, that's why I said Sloopy had this, this the complaint, and the complaint is in the uh, comments right now that there's an uneven. Although yeah. Tasman, I think it was that said that uh, you can kind of use that to your advantage, and when you're doing the uh, rapid fire to dig the holes, it slows the game down. So, yeah, I think it basically it paused for any sound effects because it didn't. Uh... Try to do it in the background. Any tips or tricks for the game? You, you mentioned one already, Ken, about you know going down and firing if close to the ground yeah. so you can get there quick. It's a it's that's yeah, a limited payoff one because eventually you're gonna get hit by one of those hidden missiles doing that. So yeah, did, did you find any advantages to using the diagonal shots? Because I, I thought I was going to, and it didn't really help. Um some people seem to think that that worked to kind of build to uh, shoot holes in the ground that the the uh, upper plane is going to drop bombs onto to try to fill. A little bit yeah, of a weird concept that it, it drops bombs to fill holes in, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's capsizing the ground, I guess. I don't know. There you go. Uh, the only real tip I had is uh, make sure you go back and get your your missiles topped up on the landing thing on the left hand yeah, side as much as you, possible. Yeah, because if you if you don't, you eventually will run out right when you absolutely need them, and then you're dead. And um, you can only carry one dollar sign at a time, so 
don't try to get a second one because it's just a waste of ammo and a waste of time. Yep. Take it back to your home base first and refill your missiles while you're there. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't have any other tips. As you can tell by my score, I wasn't very good at it. So. <laughs> so, yeah. That that was uh, Buried Bucks. And the other game we were playing was um, Cutthroat Goes Digging. Cutthroat Goes Digging, yep. Oh, Cutthroat, Basically a yes. Space Panic clone. It's a cut, Cutthroat game. <laughs> <laughs> cutthroat Controls. I saw a few yeah. comments where people were saying, oh, the... It has 300 as the top score on there to get your uh, name onto the uh, scoreboard. That's going to be simple. Then everybody's like, oh, no, it's not that simple. Score 300 points in that game. <laughs> no, it took a while. <laughs> but for those of you who are fans of uh, Space Panic in the arcade or Apple Panic on the Apple II Plus and a bazillion other clones on other machines, uh, it's one of, play one of the those. Cocos. Well, the Coco has other ones, too, that I would prefer yeah. over it, too. But it's, it's one that originally in the Dragon, so that's a bit more unique, I guess, in, the, in that respect. Well, and I know that one of the problems that you had with it is that you have to use the, uh, if you're using joystick, you also have to use the keyboard for filling in the holes. Yeah, and that distraction of having to go, you know, kick your joystick centered or whatever, and then go have to hit with the other hand is just too distracting. I preferred the color panic method of where you hold the joystick down while holding the button down to fill in and lift it up to dig. So it's, it's all one control. See, the way I was playing it, I guess this is my tip and trick for that, is that I just kind of hovered my hand right near the uh, keyboard, and then um, I would just drop my hand that's holding the joystick right on top of my space bar to fill it in. Yeah. I honestly thought it was going to be easier on keyboard, but the keyboard controls are a bit fussier with going up ladders and stuff, so it didn't yeah. really help. That was actually kind of my downfall, is going up and down the ladders, because when you have ladders that are multiple levels... I found it a little bit different. It's pixel perfect to try to get off the ladder. So I've always found myself going a little too high or a little yeah. too low. And then you can't get and off and get, get hit. And then getting hit. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. The one the one tip I have on Cuthbert goes digging is that you don't have to finish digging a hole. If there's an alien coming after you, you know you don't have enough time to dig a full hole. So he falls dig in. You one can just shot, dig one or going. two, yeah. which will slow him down because he'll fill the thing in, but it'll give you time to get further away either to get you know, onto a ladder to get away from him, or if you have enough room to get far enough away that you can dig a full hole that he'll fall into and die. Absolutely. And um, I did notice, so if you dig a hole and an alien falls in it and there's another alien right behind him, he'll go up to the hole and turn around and go the other way, so he won't cross over the hole to go after I you. had a few times that didn't happen. If the aliens are right on but top of each other. If they're right on top of each other, one will fall into the hole and the other one will continue on over it. Yeah. That burned me more than once. Yeah, that's, that's, yeah. So that's the time that if they're spaced apart, they will not, the second one will not cross the hole to get to you. If they're right on top of each other, then just it run. It will cross over. Just run! <laughs> over its comrade's back. Yeah. As it's slowly sinking in the hole and dying, it's running right across to get you. But uh, I don't know, does anybody else on the uh, panel have any tips or tricks or anybody in the comments or? Breather game. If you, if you haven't Breather said game. anything yeah. about Buried Bucks yet. Or Cuthbert Goes not. Digging, a dragon game that was actually sold in North America from Tom X. And definitely shows that it's a dragon game or a European game because of the pixel perfectness of everything you have to do in it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there looking a, at, is looking there at the Cuthbert? instructions on this one, it, it it basically indicates that it's a continuation of the previous Cuthbert game where you were turning off the lights up on the spaceport. Oh, the Cuthbert goes roundabout. Yeah, yeah it, it was that one. Because the yeah, it's the same character, since... same graphics mode, everything. Like the colors are the same too. So it's that one actually looks like a proper Cuthbert sequel. Some of the other quote unquote Cuthberts is just attaching the name to something completely different, like. Cuthbert right. in the jungle. <laughs> like it doesn't resemble Cuthbert at all. Does Cuthbert go OS9 at all? No. Come on. You have to you have to move all the Cuthbert games into OS9, Curtis. I can maybe fix them if I do that. <laughs> 
make them even get them running in uh, 6309 so they're even harder at <laughs> pixel perfectness. <laughs> Put in some random pauses every once in a while. Yeah, it'd be awesome. <laughs> You're running long. Great. Oh, well, we're going to pause for a second. You'll kind of like, what did it crash? And then you'll get killed. All right. Tricop so, 1974, by the way, is saying Cuthbert in space was always the best in his opinion. I like we played that, that one, one I think. Yeah, yeah, we did play that one. It was hard, but that one was a bit more fair. I mean, you got to get killed if you're on the edges trying to pick up the, what is it, gold or whatever it was. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so I guess if nobody else has anything to say about that, uh, let's take a look at our live Game On Challenge episode. And I guess Sloopy's not here to talk about it, so I guess I have to talk about it. So, as you can see, there was people playing both games. I think we had maximum of six players. And um, there was uh, a little bit of annoyance this this week with the games. <laughs> a little? <laughs> some, some almost colorful language. I think I did let slip a couple yeah, a few people colorful let metaphors. Slip a few things. So my apologies to the uh the audience. I think I let slip a couple of things too. So <laughs> boy, that's gotta be some game to make a Canadian swear. Oh, we swear like sailors. I don't know where you're getting that impression from. <laughs> Absolutely. We just don't usually do it in public. Yeah. <laughs> We're too polite to do it in public. There you go. <laughs> Um, yeah, so Thursday nights at whatever local time it is for you, which is five o'clock for me. I don't know whatever that means 8 for you. 8 p.m. Guys. Eastern. Yeah. 7 Central. And, uh, yeah, so five o'clock if you're on the best coast. And, uh, yeah, so come out and you don't even have to play. Yeah, I do actually kind of funny find it funny that everybody played both these games for most of the uh, show, even though you don't have to play the game of the week. Everybody it's only like getting... a count on the scoreboard though. You have to play the games that are actually being featured. Yeah. Well, I mean, you don't have to play it online on this to submit a score. And I did want to at least get on the scoreboard for Cuthbert <laughs> and it, it took me an hour and a half, but at least I finally broke yep. the 300. <laughs> I managed to break the 300 too. I was so very happy. <laughs> thought it was after i did that i thought it's a wonderful game <laughs> i couldn't even get it to spell my name right for crepe's sake it's uh <laughs> there's no backspace the uh <laughs> because that's because putting your name into the game is pixel perfect you yeah, cannot make a mistake <laughs> <laughs> obviously it's never seen me type All right, so um, yeah, so come out to the uh, Game On Challenge um, Discord channel on Thursday nights and join us. You don't even have to play games; you can just ridicule our gameplay because that would have <laughs> been really easy this week. I don't know if you saw Jim Gary's comment, but he does uh, a colorful metaphor word. A need more MC10 games, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> He's Canadian, so of course he's that's where yeah. I know too. He was uh Jim was in the audience on uh Thursday too, and we were trying to get him to join and play some games. We he's he's not a to... games player, just a games programmer, though. He's kind of like Nick that yeah. way. We even tried to prime him with uh some MC10 games, but he said no, he only programs them. He should come on for at least some of the Inafudu games, like the next time we get another new one of those. And for those who have never been on the Game On Challenge before, you can join in on our Discord, Coco Discord. And uh, if you don't have an emulator set up or you don't have you know, a real Coco that actually has any hardware hooked up to your main machine to actually do the broadcast with, you can actually play most of these games online from the Color Computer Archive. You will see a Play It Now button on the right-hand side of the game if that has an option, and you can actually try them that way. Yep. So then you can just uh, share your screen for that. So... And I believe the Dragon Archive, World of Dragon Archive, also has the same option. It'll link over to the online emulators. 
So oh, I, I didn't try that. I didn't even I, know it was I, an option. I believe it's I believe it's in there. I mean, even before the color computer archive, I believe. Kieran would know for sure. Yeah, he's in the chat, so we'll, well, hopefully he's still in the chat. He can answer that decisively. All right, so there you have absolutely no excuse not to join us. Except work. That's important. <laughs> yeah, whatever. What's more important, work, earning a living, being able to eat, or playing video games. <laughs> <laughs> Greatest diet plan ever invented. <laughs> Except I always eat chips when I play, so that doesn't really work. All right, so I guess... What are you going to horrify us with this week, Ken? Well, we've got one more week of uh, Cuthbert Goes Digging. It's doing bad so far. Is, Continue. is that not horrifying <laughs> enough? <laughs> I'm sure you're going to make it much worse. <laughs> How about this one? Oh, that's a Mark Data Products one. Yep. Does anybody else recognize it? What was your clue? Oh, the name's there for right. Oh, it is too. I forgot about that. <laughs> Self promotion. Nobody, nobody else recognizes this one. This what, is another game fighter? where bingo. Uh, Got yep. it. Another game where everything kills you. Touching the side of the screen. Uh, you can only shoot one bullet at a time. And uh is you have a limited number of shots. So, as was mentioned. Uh, Jim Gary got in the fighter. chat, too. So, there you go. We're going to be playing Time Fighter. How is that for a pick, Curtis? That's better than the other ones. This one I can actually I can do somewhat decently at. <laughs> is, that, is, is that what uh, the Time Bandit needs in order to get to the opening part of his game? <laughs> Unfortunately, no, because Time Bandit's no. a really good game. This this one's good, but it's not you know top tier. I would say. Basically, you go through different time periods. You got the dragons, and then you got the planes, and you got the alien ships. Um, you got two alternating screens, so you have to shoot a certain amount of the aliens, and you can move up vertically and left and right. Should mention that that's an important part of it. Um, the first screen, which I think Ken had just showed the screenshot there, uh, is basically just you know they're coming down. Don't hit the walls. Yeah, that's fatal. Um, on the second screen uh, for each one, though, you get you're basically flying in the dark, and you send out this little triangular light up area, so you can kind of see where everything's coming at you. But as soon as the beam goes past, you can't see squat, and you get one automatic beam firing every time it goes off. The previous one goes off the top of the screen, so you kind of have to gauge the speed and what aliens are coming after you, type thing, uh, to shoot them down. So it has a bit, quite a bit of a challenge. There's like mines and stuff. I think if I remember on that level, Ken, if I remember correctly. Um, I haven't made it that far yet. Oh, okay. I know about it. I just haven't made it there yet. <laughs> this is one where you have to like pick your shots and make sure they hit. Um, yeah. if you hit the opponent's bullets, I think the shot your shot stops. It doesn't go through like it gets blocked. Yeah. So you have to do it a little bit. But offset. you do destroy that. You do destroy their bullet too. Yeah. Is it one shot on the screen at once? I remember. Yeah. Yeah. One shot I think on you the screen at once. Yeah. It's challenging. It's when I, when I first saw the ads, I thought it was going to be a time pilot clone, and it's not. Not no. close. And Rick has joined us again. What happened, Rick? Did you have to leave for a bit there? <laughs> Did you have an internet outage or what? Uh, am I here? Yep. Yeah, We. if you're going to have a two-hour power outage, it should happen in the middle of the day. Um, <laughs> I have to go turn the stove off now. You guys will understand. Well, yep, Rick... <laughs> You should have your power outage during the news, then you won't miss anything. <laughs> well, no, because I got to do the index and stuff, so I got to watch the whole show again anyway. That's true. Uh, I yeah, get you to were inflicted it it on yourself twice. I get <laughs> to do universe. it at one and a half speed, so you know that's okay. But uh, it, it went out when you started to pl uh, charge your car out front, right? Oh, come on, get a horse. <laughs> Hey, right. welcome back, Rick. And uh, so My thanks again just... for picking a slightly better game. Uh, pro tip, guys. If you get a new phone like I just did, go on and reassign and reassert all of your accounts to the new phone immediately because it's really hard to hit the email, the confirmation, the login screen that you're trying to do on Twitch while you're trying to confirm the uh, 
just when, when you fall back to your phone, it's really hard to re, to uh, confirm all of your accounts. So do it while your desktop computer is still working. Uh, don't this, wait until the last second. I spent the whole two hours getting Twitch to let me into my own account to find out that there is a bug where the uh, keyboard doesn't pop up when you try to put in your confirmation code. And so you can't get back on Twitch with just your phone. So yeah, anyway. That, that was my wow. last two hours. So I, I will see what happened, what I missed soon. Your okay. Well, I'm glad you got your power back red. anyway. <laughs> you, you don't want like a no furnace running or anything like that in, in the weather we're rolling. Well, like I say, I, I had the stove on just in case, you know, start getting them. them so you have a natural here. gas stove or what kind of stove do you yeah, have? Yeah, I've got a stove. Okay. The clicker don't work, but if you got a lighter, which, uh, you know. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah, no, I have an electric for, stove, so it wouldn't have helped me any. That'll, that'll trip <laughs> well, no, you, you got to have one gas yeah. appliance. <laughs> I was going to say, that'll trip your beard. <laughs> yeah. I have to light newspapers on fire. That's what I got to do. <laughs> Turn on a oh, yeah, oh. And you're, so, so you're pretty reliable on your electrical service, are you? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it's pretty rare. The power goes out here maybe once a year, if I'm lucky. Well, same here, especially on a warm, sunny, calm day. Yeah, I wonder so, if somebody hit a pole or something. Yeah, it was weird because they, you know, it was out for an hour. It came on, it went back out. You know, crew was dispatched. It came on, it went back out. I'm saying they put up a new transformer. The new transformer went kaboom. At least you said, oh, have, yeah, we need to get some more crews out here. At least <laughs> you don't have the luck of having it, uh, your electric turned off when your PC says, don't turn off your PC updating. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. New BIOS <laughs> flash. Perfect. That's usually when my uh, power does go out. Yeah. yeah. So, so by the just, way, uh, uh, Mark Siegel in the chat says, "Ricky, when did you move to Texas, or in the, your case, back to Texas? Because apparently that's fairly <laughs> common there." Um, born in Cincinnati. Um, grandparents' hometown was Savoy and Denton and Bell, so te- North Central Texas. So I ended up back in North Central Texas. I grew up all through high school there. Um, what was your first computer? We're not doing another interview, Ron. We don't time. Right. It was a teletype. I'll, I'll show you sometime. That's but right. Yeah. So, so it was an abacus. Abacus. The best. It was an abacus. Face it. It was an abacus, yeah. wasn't it? That was yeah. so, 33 so, AS. Sorry. Yeah. I had paper tape, damn it. I could punch my program out. And I had so, to because... They gave so us right. no storage. So so do what I did. You get a generator, you'll never need to use it. That's a good idea. The umbrella theory. I'll, I'll bolt it up in the attic, so it's not practical, but I have one. And you I'll never have to turn it on. And it comes That's without right. gas. And you don't remember that you need gas. Well, no, natural gas keeps going. I mean... Those guys, yeah. I could, I could, I could tell the stages of the power outage because the power went out, and then a little while later, my cell signal went down to like one bar because the local tower went down, and then I got a thing from AT and T saying, "Hey, your internet's down because the battery and the fiber to premises had went down." So I could see everything getting worse and worse and worse and worse. And, and you, and you know how long the battery backup on the cell tower. And the fiber are yeah. ATT is about an hour. The cell tower is about a half hour. And uh, but I can still, if I stand in the right part of the house, I can still get cell phone, even when the local tower is down. I can reach some. I, I will read two comments related to this, and then we're going to go on on to the next part of the show. Please do. <laughs> okay. Franklin Harris says uh, we have a whole house generator worth every penny, and then Mark mm. Siegel says I have a generator and I still get power outages. So apparently that is not a. Wait a minute. Oh, right. The generator's broke. Perfect. <laughs> yeah, gener- generator runs on electricity, right? <laughs> or you just you run need electricity gas. to start it. Uh, anyway, what's, what's the next segment? <laughs> Where are we going uh, let's next? do the, the game the game on news first, since that's kind of what uh, we're queued up from. Okay. Or do you want to do your announcements? I'll, I'll do the game on news first, then the announcements, then we'll take a break. We'll come back for the regular news because there's a bit of it this week.
Okay. Once again, thanks to Nick Berendis for creating that little bumper. Hey. I'm just making sure you're still awake, Nick. Is that who we got to blame? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, you guys seeing uh, game number 124, Guadalcanal? Yes. Okay, cool. So the uh, website, the Wargaming Scribe, who covers war games, obviously, uh, for all platforms, uh, decided to hit another Cocoa One. Now, most of the time, he's not too impressed with the Cocoa Ones because they're, A, they're really old, and they're kind of not the most intelligent ones, etc. So usually he's been giving absolutely scathing reviews, saying it's basically obsolete, you should never play it type thing. Uh, I think one exception is he did across the Rubicon, and that actually, I think he rated one star. So this one here, he actually ended up playing it over the course of two episodes on his blog. And this one here, I mean, obviously, it's still quite primitive. It's all text-based, and he does an extended map here. But he actually kind of liked this one. It kind of got a little bit disappointing to him near the end. Uh, but once again, he does his incredible deep dives into playing this. And I just don't have the time nor inclination of playing war simulator games to do this kind of a deep dive. So I'm really glad his site's here. And he's actually doing some other Coco ones coming up soon, too, which I'll discuss uh, a little bit of help he'll need. <clears throat> but he goes through the entire campaign. And he, he kind of mentions by the end of the first one that, you know, it's got some pretty impressive things in it, especially for a Coco game. He was quite surprised. And then he went on to his second one. And this is where, you know, it kind of got a little bit repetitive, et cetera. But uh, I'll, I'll just kind of summary it down to the, his actual final ratings on it. And he usually rates it by several different categories. So you can kind of tell what you're getting into if you want to try this out. So he gave it two stars out of five, which, I mean, sounds pretty bad. But for most of the old, old 8-bit ones, that's actually fairly decent. That's probably above average. In fact, I think out of the 125 games he's done so far, this is in the top 30 with a two out of five score. So he's obviously much favors the more modern, full, you know, detail ones. But he mentions here, like, presentation, very poor. That's because it's in semi-graphics. Um, some future Arc Rail games, which is what this one's from, will eventually turn into P-Mode Artifacting. I don't know if you'll like those much better or not. We'll see. Not that he's played those yet. Uh, the user interface, clarity of rules and outcomes, very poor. This is pretty standard for the really old stuff. But systems, he actually gave it a good rating, which was quite a surprise. He said the game shines in this category. I'm particularly impressed at the number of options that the game gives to the players, with most of them involving a sacrifice of some sort. <clears throat> and he goes into some details on that, too. So he, he actually did quite like that part. Um, scenario design and balancing, he actually said, was adequate, which is a pretty good rating for a cocoa based war game for him. Um, did I make interesting decisions? Every turn until almost the end with almost every unit. So... One thing he mentioned during the course of the two-part review is that he would think he has things licked. He's just going to wipe out the enemy, and all of a sudden, the enemy would do a surprise, kind of like sometimes happens in real life in war. And all of a sudden, he was scrambling just to protect his troops and, and try to keep you know things going type thing. So he was, as he kind of described it, on the edge of his seat almost, you know, because he, you know, within five turns, things could completely swing around. And both him and the opponents are waiting for resupplies to come back and... A oh. bunch of other things too. So he had a final rating of two stars, um, so which he said he almost Vulcan? knew. Sorry, is that Vulcan or something. What do you mean? You know, the stellar career is satisfactory. Oh, <laughs> you mean like Spock? <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, like Picard, he had a satisfactory career. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, he, he thought it wasn't that bad. And his final statement here, Phil Keller, who's the author of and also the owner of Arc Roll Games, the guy who founded it, said, was certainly a better designer than a coder. And I think Phil did improve as he went because these first ones were written in base. And he said, I'm looking forward to his next games. And he goes, I'm lucky. He released no fewer than six historic war games in 1984. And this is from the, you know, the beginning of 84. So he actually reached out to me directly and uh, mentioned it. I don't know if anybody in the panel or anybody in the chat... Uh, might be able to help him on this, but he's got a couple of these other six that he's coming up on that he either does not have a download for at all, or he does not have the manual. And he's hoping that maybe somebody out there listening or viewing might have these. So in specific, he needs the manual for the game called the battle of Tunis. The actual disc image is on the archive already. I can't remember if I have it on my site yet. I didn't check before the show. Uh, the other one is called Legatus L E G A T U S. That one, he needs both the game and the manual. That one, obviously, I do not have on my website because I don't have the game either. So I don't know if anybody has it, you know, it's hidden away in some of their old Cocoa discs or has picked up a, 
you know, batch of cocoa stuff on eBay or something and might have this swimming around on a, you know, quote unquote backup disc or something. Paging but, Brian uh, Weasler. Paging Brian Weasler. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, Brian's on the road today. Um, but yeah, Legatus is definitely one that he needs the game itself for. And then Battle of Tunis, he would like to have the manual. So if any of you can help, you can either reach out to me on the Discord to let me know and I get direct contact with him, or you can leave a message on his uh, actual website here, the uh, the Wargaming Scribe, which you can just search for that in Google. You'll find it right away. And he covers multi-platform and stuff. So if you're interested in war games in general, um, he's he's covered a ton of them. He's covered a fair number of Cocoa ones now, a lot of Apple II, like the Strategic Simulations ones, Avalon Hill, et cetera, some of the big names. Good Those stuff. Though. He always does very detailed day. reviews. Sorry. Those are very good back in the day. And it was the more, more in-depth ones on the Apple II or the strategic simulation ones. Yeah. Avalon Hill was kind of hit or miss. They sometimes did really good. Sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, next up after that, um, <clears throat> we have a few stories from Alan Huffman here, but uh, this is uh, one that is a bit more specific on the gaming side. So he's actually taking an old game for the VIC-20 hero, because he had a VIC-20 before he got his first Coco 2. And basically, the VIC had the redefinable character set, so he wrote a little bomb-catching, kind of like a popcorn-style thing. And uh, he decided to try to get it to work on the Coco 3, or Coco 2, using Pimo 4 graphics. And he's using the same two colors. Now, the proportion of the screen's a little bit different, because the VIC-20 has, what is it, a 22 character wide by... Yeah, 22 I can't remember the exact by price. 16 or something like that. I think it's taller than the Coco, but narrower as far as characters, if I remember correctly. At any rate, he was quite surprised, and I'll just quote him here for the audio listeners. I'm a bit surprised the Coco is almost as fast doing all the high-res graphics as the Vic was just poking a character into the text screen. So that'd be like running a, you know, like the low-res character string graphics on the Coco, but it actually kept up pretty good if you, if you do even bite boundaries. So the Vic's on the left and the uh, Coco's on the right. He's not moving the the player character to catch things, but basically it's uh, it's not too far off speed wise. So that was interesting. Uh, next up, we have a couple from a uh, Jim Gary who's in the chat. At least they hopefully still in the chat. So uh, the two that he did this week, one is called Eights, originally by Mike Costello in the August nineteen eighty two issue of Practical Computing Magazine. The original article was not the full game. It sounds like it was more about the AI routines it sells for the, the computer player type thing for Crazy Crazy 8s is what this is a clone of. So Jim decided to make the code into a functional game um, by basically adding the, the actual, you know, the game part of it versus just the, uh, you know, how does the computer make decisions to do this kind of thing? And uh, we've seen a few Crazy 8 games. I know uh, Pierre Sarazin has done one called Color 8, I think, which is basically a Crazy 8 style. And he's done both Coco uh, Disk Basic and OS 9 versions of it for Coco 1, 2, or 3. His is more graphical. This is more of a text style. And then the second one that Jim Gary converted this week was a game called Snertle, S-N-E-R-T-L-E, which is an educational game that originally appeared in the May 1984 issue of Compute Magazine. And Compute Magazine is one of those magazines that did cross-platform uh, for a variety of uh, 8-bit machines back in the day. And you can see it's kind of an animated, you know, math educational game here, but it has this little, little turtle that says good if you get the answer right. Uh, I do like the fact they actually drew the uh, the numbers with actual graphic characters as opposed to just the, the standard text font, so it actually looks pretty decent. So that's the two that Jim did this week. Next up, we have Expertech, X-P-E-R. Um, this is a, I can't remember if it's Brazilian or Spanish off the top of my head, but it's a, a foreign language site, and the guy's a, a tech by trade. But he's got a real Coco 2 hooked up to an old amber screen monitor, and he, he plays Coco games every once in a while records. So in this particular case here, and I'll turn the volume down a bit because I think he has some background music and stuff to it. But he decides to, oh, there's Time Patrol. Um, he decides to play, in this case, Kron, which is, of course, a one of the several Coco clones of Tron, the arcade game. Which I, I think we've covered this one on the Game on Challenge before, haven't we, Ken? Yes. Okay. 
So if, if you haven't been part of the game on Challenge, you can go back and try to catch up on some of these other games we've covered. Yeah, there's only 200. <laughs> Uh, next up, Chronologically Gaming uh, has covered a couple of Coco games. Uh, speaking of war games, the first one is uh, Avalon Hills VC. Now, this was a multi-platform game. It came out the Atari 8-bits, the Apple IIs, later on the C64. Um, I think this one, he might have got a bit out of sequence because currently he's doing September of 1982, and that is when it appeared on some of the other uh, platforms. But I think the Coco one didn't come out till closer to the end of the year, maybe even the beginning of 83. Um, cause I've seen some ads that are you know, more along the December line of things and the copyright, I believe actually on screen is 83. Uh, this version for the Coco was actually written by Britt Monk. Um, if you guys have played 3d breakthrough, he did that. Uh, he's done some other games like, uh, the gauntlet game, the little 4k arcade game. He did that one as well, which eventually got sold through, uh, Avalon as well. It looks like, like Britt actually tried selling a few of his games on his own directly with these little hand drawn advertisements and color computer news and stuff in 82 and then avalon hill took notice of several of them and then basically offered him a contract and started selling multiple games of his uh one other thing about this particular one vc the very first version of it was for the tier setting model one and three and the gameplay uh presentations are a fair bit different on that due to the limitations of graphics versus text but the tier setting model one three version was also written by brick monk so he actually programmed for both so for those of you who haven't seen it i'll just play a little tiny clip Coco. All of these, oh, I was a bit here. Your units, or at least it shows the apple here. Nice splash screen. We can joystick it. And yes. both joystick or keyboard controls, which is kind of nice. And we get a musical tune. You can see the presentation's better. Wow, yeah, this is much better. And you can see the copyright, 1983. Yeah, this would have been played the end of the fall, 1982. This is point and select controls. Wow. I now, this is one of the few that. versions at this time that actually had the joystick Sweet. fully so controlled you where you're looking at you different pieces on the, the board, this uh, selecting which one to, say, launch an attack from and where to launch to. Uh, Most of uh, the other ones used either like the, just the keyboard. Uh, front, In fact, some of them used a grid like Battleship, like G3 type thing. Oh, thank you, Curtis. Yeah. Uh, it um, may have been early but the Coco one actually was a fairly yeah, advanced compared to the other versions at the time as to how it actually has the player's selections. Oh, we have U.S. troops there. Got it. Okay, that's right, because we're supposed to move this one, infantry, and move there. Sweet. And every time you move, it's going to show an unidentified Vietnamese. Sweet. We have the artillery where we can fire to. What? Fire in. Yeah, so you can fire in unidentified spots. Wow. Oh, nice. Bit of artifact colors there, even. It looks like a fairly decent game. I did try playing this a little bit back in the day, because of course we had a <clears throat> backed up copy in the club. Um, but I, I, I never really got into uh, the war gaming scene that much. I got into role playing games, but not so much the war gaming scene. But this was one of the ones that it was at least somewhat simple enough that at least I could try to make some headway on it. I was just wondering, anybody else in the panel here? Did any of you guys get into war games much at all? Either on the old, you know, the board ones that Avalon Hill used to sell before they got in computers, or the computerized ones, and that doesn't matter if it's Coco or not. If you've tried it on any other platforms, like Mark, did you play any of the Apple II ones? You were mentioning some of the strategic simulations ones earlier. No, I didn't really play them. I, I didn't have access to them either, money wise or otherwise. Uh, so, <laughs> I think the Apple games are much more popular on those used floppy disks. But uh, anyway, no, but they looked intriguing from the people I knew that played. Uh, oh, what was the? Uh, um, it was the big one, uh, board game. Yeah, it was a hexagon based, uh, yeah, hexagon one I remember being popular on the Apple II. Yeah, and, the, and the sportswear make one. Sports yeah, one? they made some. We, we had a fair number of them on the Coco, like, um, Soft Ride made some. Avalon Hill is probably the most famous because they that's almost exclusively what they did, and there was a few others as well. Avalon Hill obviously did a few for the Coco as well. Um, I, I just I never got into it. I mean, I'm a bit of a history buff, so I mean, I understand what some of the, the scenarios they're talking about in some of these games are, but to actually run a simulation of them, I just never really had an interest for it. Is Rama one? Um, that's more of an arcade game than a yeah, simulation. It's more like, it's more like oh. the uh, Atari, uh, uh, okay. what is it, Battle Zone? Yeah. Right. 
I guess you could kind of call it a tank simulator, but not a not a war game simulator. Like it's a very simplistic. It's just you know, I'm driving a tank. I got to shoot stuff. These mm-hmm. you got to like plan strategies. Like you're gonna get, you know, your uh, troops are gonna get refreshed from the you know water behind you in three turns, and you got to try to plan where your people are so they the equipment's ready for them. Like it's very detailed. Well, I guess when you get to the old board games, I did that risk thing in just basic, which. Yeah, that's kind of you like know, a junior it's, version it's, of one of these. It's it's kind of a junior war game thing, you know. So that's I guess yeah, that's one game I did play, like not just your version, but other computer versions of it as well as you know the board game. I used to love Stratego. I oh yeah, that, that was be. that was an interesting board game. Yeah, yeah. kind of a. I mean, I guess a really simple version would be like Battleship. But... Yeah, that was good. But these these are so much more sophisticated than that because you got to keep track of you know weapons and arms and number of men, how trained they are, how experienced they are, uh, exactly. You know, what kind of resources you're going to use trying to cross a river going through thick forest versus a road? You know, like there's just a ton of stuff. It's a it's a full sim. It's like Sim City at war type thing. Is Shanghai considered a war game? No, no. that's just a tile game. Okay. And then the uh, another episode this week, he covered uh, one from Coco Cassette, which is T&D. Um, and this one is called Robot Bomber by Andrew Pekursky, who did a ton of these games for both Chromaset and T&D. He was very prolific during the 81 through 84 era. We're on the TRS-80 color computer. This is Robot Bomber. Robot Bomber only has a... Robot Bomber. Start. I don't think we played right, so this it's one, Ken. It's a game that uses joysticks. The player on the right controls a spaceship and tries to destroy. But of course, seven two players, so that might make it a bit difficult, except screen. maybe at the show. The player on the left joystick uses the shield to intercept the falling bombs, and they also have a scanning rocket that can fire at the spaceship, pressing the joystick button. So this is only two players at the same time, which means for this channel, I have hooked up both controllers and I'm controlling both on the same joystick. So it's going to look. It's like got pretty unique gameplay. So I'll, I'll let him. I'm making it so Talk we can about play a demo at a little the bit same here. time. Here we go. Push space bar to start. All right, so you can see here, this is player one as the spaceship. And when the, sp- the spaceship drops bombs, player two controls the bottom blue uh, disc and also the blue disc on the right side. So it's player one's yellow, player two is blue. And so player one's trying to blow up all the robots. And then player two is trying to deflect it. Oh, make sure that they don't get dro- bombs dropped on top of them. And hopefully mm. you can take out the UFO. Like this. Oh, missed him. There we go. <laughs> so if you do both, uh, never mind. Yeah, they are hard to see. So was that Rick? I said if you do both, you're playing with yourself. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's definitely meant to be two player because it's a bit too much <laughs> to keep track of. But I, I like the fact that you have different things to keep track of. It's not two players doing the same thing, right. just head to head. You got the one that's trying to protect with his little blue shield and he's got that little blue thing going up the side of the screen that you click the button and it'll fire it off to try to hit the saucer. But the saucer has got full eight directional movement and tries to shoot the uh, robots, you know, getting past the shield. So it's each player has different gameplay. So if you swap sides, <clears throat> you actually get a different gaming experience, which I thought was kind of unique. Most of the time you get a, a two player head to head type stuff. It's usually like if, if if you switch sides, it means nothing. It's just what side is right. my score showing up on, but it's the exact same gameplay. And this is actually quite different. So I thought that was pretty unique. And Andrew did a lot of these unique um, takes on games. He very, very rarely did clones. Most of the games he did for TND and for Chroma Set were originals. Um, and some of them like so original that they've never been duplicated since. Not necessarily maybe a good thing, but at least you knew you were getting something different. And then the last one for the game section <clears throat> is from Patman QC on YouTube. And he did a history of Rampage video. Now, this covers the history of Rampage in the arcades, including the sequels. And then he goes into some of this, the further sequels that were done on some of the more modern gaming systems like PlayStations, etc. And he goes through all the consoles and all the whole computer versions of it, including the Tier City Coco 3 one. Um and he thought the Coco 3 one was pretty decent. It's, it's actually ranked higher than a fair bit of the other ones, from the, especially from the 8-bit side of things. Because, of course, there's been more modern ones on, on 16-bit and 
you know, modern consoles too. I, I won't play the clip here. It's a 45 minute video, but it actually goes through the history of the development of Rampage, which is quite interesting. I didn't know most of this stuff, um, including, you know, uh, some uh, article interviews with the original author, the person who created it, how his upper management was wanting to ban it at first because you were eating cops and they th considered that to be a bad move for a, a video game for kids. And then, New management took over and thought, this is a great idea. And then they, they they said, go ahead and go and do it. So that whole history part at the beginning is actually worth the watch just by itself, I think. I was kind of hoping that uh, Bruce Moore would be in the chat here because, of course, he his, his son Jacob got some pointers from Steve Bjork on the Coco version and on the arcade version of it here. So I was wondering if they could maybe chip in a few things about it and maybe even comment on the video. So hopefully if they catch the uh, the show later on there, they can actually do that. Because they, I think Steve Bjork had some inside stuff too from doing the port, but uh, well done documentary. I'm kind of looking forward to see what other histories he's going to go into, and maybe some other you know Coco covered games as well that had official ports. And that's the end of the uh, game on news. So, do you want one more break, and then we'll get into the full news? Uh, uh we could do that. Or do you want me to do the uh, announcements for shows coming up first and then do the break-in news? Yeah, go do the announcements. Okay. <clears throat> so let me switch. Okay, so first up, uh, the next interview we have booked is on February the 3rd. Please note the date changed because it was originally going to be earlier. Glenn Dahlgren's coming back. It's the final book of his Chaos series, which you can see here, including the box set shown at the bottom. And he's doing book tours for this right now. Um, so thank him for uh, you know having the time to come on our show. But he's also dug out some old stuff from Sundog. So he's got some uh, promotional materials and some other stuff that is very rarely seen, including some custom watches he had made for Sundog, which I've never seen even after meeting Glenn multiple times at uh, Coco Fest and Rainbow Fest back in the day. So I'm, I'm, I'm curious to see some of the stuff he found here too. And of course, if you've been buying or you know reading the rest of his books here in the, the Chaos series, then obviously you'll be interested in the final chapter, uh, which will close off the entire series. And then for upcoming shows, <clears throat> the first one here, which is coming up rapidly, it's about a month away now, uh, is VCF Southern California, VCF SoCal, which you can actually hit their website at VCF SoCal, S-O-C-A-L dot com. This is February 17th to the 18th in Orange, California at the Hotel Fair Event Center. Um, an update from last time is that Thomas Cherry Holmes will be a speaker at the show. And I think I have that yeah, right here. We're talking about uh, Fujinet. <clears throat> and he's mentioned in our Discord, I mean, it originally in the Atari, it's been adapted to the Apple II and others, but he's actually going to be mentioning and possibly showing off the current progress on the Cocoa version of Fujinet. So if you're in the area of orange in california and can make it down to the show definitely swing by his uh booth to talk to him but also attend his uh his talk on on fujinet which should include some cocoa demonstrations amongst other platforms as well and he's been making a lot of progress we'll be covering a bit of that in the news here too over the last month in particular so well worth checking out uh next up after that is the interim computer festival march 23rd to 24th in the Pacific Northwest area, which is in Seattle at the Interest Space in Seattle, Washington. And this is uh, the attempt to get this going back up and coming to becoming back to becoming a VCF, uh, which uh, kind of disappeared there over COVID. I know Mark Overholzer is planning to making it. I yep. think Tim Linder was talking about it. I don't know if he's going to make it or not. Hopefully I think he did he the last one. Hopefully he'll do this one too. <clears throat> and hopefully AJ can make it out as well. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, I, 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 they've been talking about the fact that they've got five exhibits, two demo speakers, and two volunteers. I haven't seen specifically anything of what the speakers are. Do you know, Mark? Uh, no, I hadn't seen an announcement yet, but I better go check my email. So, yeah, it looks like they have stuff up. So, cool. Okay. So, we'll give you an update on that uh, in the following weeks to come. Of course, the big one for us in the Cocoa community is the 32nd annual Last Chicago Cocoa Fest, which is being held at the Carroll Stream uh, Hotel or, or uh, Holiday Inn and Suites at Carroll Stream, Illinois, which is, of course, near Chicago, not too far from the O'Hare Airport. 
And uh, I think there's five tables left. I was hoping Grant would still be on the call to give us an update on that. If I did try to refresh the page earlier, it looks like it's the same five tables left here. Everything else is completely booked. Oh, he made an announcement. They have some tables in the hall. Uh, it's on our Discord. Yeah, 14 or something I think he mentioned. Yeah. They're so, opening up in the hall. Yeah. Nice. So it's the five left in the room plus uh, the uh, overflow. Oh, yep, the overflow. <laughs> It's going to be a great show. I mean, we've we've now started teasing some of the stuff that Brian Weezer's bringing from the the Bob Kilgus uh, collection, including the deluxe color computer. So that'll be on display there as well. Some other stuff from Bob you guys don't know about yet. Um, <laughs> plus, there's you know a ton of other stuff happening here too. So uh, just it's 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 if you're a Coco person, this is this is the show to go to. If you're more in the gaming side of things, uh, we have. Uh, Boat Fest, the third annual on the uh, 14th and 15th of June 2024, or 14th to 16th, I should say, uh, at the social event space in Hurricane, West Virginia. Uh, this is a cross platform gaming oriented, but it does have hardware and you know, just general talking about computers and stuff and consoles, et cetera. Sometimes they even bring like pinball machines and all kinds of things. There's been some pretty exotic foods from other countries, from people that are coming from overseas to visit which are quite interesting to try, as Ken and I know. Um, but definitely, if you're into gaming, this is definitely one you would like to go to. There's a lot of cool stuff out of this. Unfortunately, there's a bit of a conflict of schedules here because that exact same weekend in the Dallas-Fort Worth area in Texas is VCF Southwest. And uh, that is being held at the Davidson Gundy Alumni Center at the University of Texas in Dallas, uh, June 14th to 16th, exact same time. Um I'm going to try to make it next year. I, I just would, could pull the finances together all the way down to Texas this year, but next year I'm going to try to make it. But there's been a couple of updates since we talked about this last time, uh, two of them in specific. The first one is that they have these things called shows within the show, which are kind of like subgroups that are happening at the show. And one of them is actually a Tandy assembly meetup, which is kind of similar to the one they did in California that Michael Furman reported for us recently. Uh, they got a few of those going on. So there's MDCon <clears throat> as well for Sony mini disc enthusiasts. And then Tandy Assembly. So anybody who has anything to do with Tandy, because of course, a lot of the people that worked at Tandy back in the day still live in the Fort Worth, Dallas area. Mark Siegel, I know, attended last year from uh, on behalf of Tandy, along with uh, numerous other people that were actually at a panel there. I don't think there's a panel this year for the Tandy people, but uh, they definitely are going to have a bit of a meetup. So if you're in that area at that time, I would definitely recommend going out. It'll be covering the... You know, the black and white tier, Sadie's, the Tandy 1000s, the Coco, the Videotext Terminals, and a whole bunch of other stuff. So that well, definitely Curtis, would be worth it. Yep. You only need to make it as far as my house, and I can bring you the rest of the way. <laughs> it's, it's unfortunate. It's more the uh, gas and hotels to get there and back that is going to be the killer. I'm I'm getting out of debt, but not quite fast enough to do two Coco Fest in this all in a row. Mm -hmm. But next year, I'm going to make it, pretty sure. And the other uh, panel speaker that's been added to this is Jeff Wires of Chronologically Gaming. So mm. he's uh, he was actually at the one last year, and he was actually one of the people asking questions at the end of the panel discussion that had Taylor and Amy on it. So they actually briefly talked to each other, though I don't think they knew who each other were at the time. And now Jeff's doing his own seminar at the show, and I, I mentioned uh, I can't make it this year, I'll make it next year. And he says, well, maybe I'll see if I can do another seminar next year, so then we can try to meet in person for the first time. Since I've actually guessed on his show once, we kind of met virtually once. But if you're in the history of video games uh, and even the handheld electronic games and home consoles and home computers there, then uh, definitely go check out his seminar as well. And then they've uh, announced the official dates for Tandy Assembly 2024. That's going to be September 27th to the 29th at the Courtyard by Marriott Springfield in Springfield, Ohio, which I think is the same location it was last year. So they just announced this uh, within the last week or so that they've got the official dates, et cetera. I uh, don't think they've got too much on schedules and stuff. Probably not yet. But uh, if you're interested in doing that, of course, you can actually become a sponsor. You can actually you know, sign up to actually do a presentation, et cetera. And this, of course, covers all the Tandy machines. So this covers the Black and White Terra Sadies, the Tandy 1000 series, uh, Cocos, et cetera, just just like the Tandy Assembly Meetup in um, Texas will be. So the official date, September 27th to 29th, 2024 in Springfield, Ohio. And that's all I've got for the uh, upcoming shows. Okay, then let's go into a commercial.
Hi, I'm John. And I'm Aaron of The Coco Show. And you're watching or listening to The Coco Nation, the live and interactive talk show featuring the Tandy Color Computer and its cousins. All hail The Coco Nation. Om. 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 In a world where RGB produces black and white video, one cable can make a difference. Switcheroo. Coco3scartcable.com. Today, from the land down under, where toilets flush backwards and thongs are a respectable form of casual footwear. I am Nick Morentes and I have been developing games for the Coco for over 35 years. Welcome to the Coco Nation, the interactive live video talk show for all enthusiasts of the Coco family of computers. Hi, I'm Al Curtis Boyle, and I'm Ken Waters of Canadian Retro Things, and you're watching The Coco Nation Show. Only the bravest souls enter. Only the most cunning return. Defeat innumerable monsters to ransom the King's Scepter, stolen by the evil wizard. Your sword, shield, and wits are your only allies. Pray you find a magical inn as your only respite in the forest of doom. For the tiny color computer one, two, and three. November 2017, if you dare. When you want the latest in TRS-80, Tandy, Dragon, MC-10, and all of their hardware cousins, no matter what it takes, or where news breaks, from around the world, to your nation, Coco Nation News with L. Curtis Boyle. Been waiting all the show for that. Okay, so we actually have a fair bit of news this week. Uh, first one up uh, is Bob. Are you still live streaming? Yep. Yeah. Really so. <laughs> Okay. Mike, Mike working. Yeah, you are you are now. So you're still live streaming? Ding, Mike. We can hear Any you. audio? Yeah, we can hear okay. you. Yep. You're, yeah. you're bandwidth yeah. limited oh. by far. Yeah, that's well. I'm used to that, I guess. Uh yeah, so anyway, I finished my keyboard build. Right now I am converting a color computer three to run off of DC. Um, let's see what else did I have here? Am I showing my screen? No. Um, no, but there's this light show going on of your desktop. <laughs> yeah, right now I'm just showing, uh, like I'm not playing the live stream on because I don't want it to echo back, but uh, I'm just showing the link. So if, if you can go to YouTube, Lacoco Strangiato which is Bob's page. He's actually still doing the live stream. He started it, uh, I think, an hour before our show started. Uh, first building the custom keyboard, which is you know, the main headline, which he's yeah. already done and completed. And now he's he's working on further projects, but you can actually go catch his stream live and, of course, catch it after the fact if you want to watch the whole thing. Yeah, and you can watch it at 1.5 speed. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> at one frame every second minute. Yeah, yeah. Probably watch it at 10x and get the same. <laughs> yeah, well, it looked like normal then. 
<laughs> this looks like a time actually when we, when we get near the end of the show i'll get one more update from you when i finish the news already Uh, next up, Michael Harbis, Frederick, who I thought was going to be here today, too, um, has put up the third episode of his uh, building his own custom 6309 computer board. And in this one, he's actually got his first lines of test code to make sure things are working. Um, so it's about an 11 and a half minute video. I'm obviously not going to play the, the whole thing here. I'll play a little bit of the intro just so you can kind of get a bit of it. And this is where he's kind of going for the, the more polished uh you know, tutorial style thing as opposed to just kind of the winging it and things go wrong. But uh, it's an interesting project. I'm really interesting to see how far this goes. Greetings, I'm Frederick, the micro hobbyist. In this third episode, I'm accelerating the pace by installing Flash, RAM, decode logic, and a few lines of code. Take out your breadboards as it's time to unleash the 6309. All right, that kind of gives you a tease as to what this particular episode's on. And uh, like I said, looking forward to it. I've seen, uh, I'm looking forward to the future episodes, I should say. I've already watched this one. But uh, Frederick's, of course, been quite involved. He's been on our panel a fair bit the last while. He's fairly active in our Discord. Uh, he's acting on, on a lot of uh, different uh, retro tech shows on YouTube. Uh, he appears live in the background. Occasionally will answer some questions. He's usually working on projects like this while it's going on, kind of like Bob is doing on our show here today. Uh, but yeah, he's, he's working on a 3 megahertz uh 6309 based uh machine he's going to try to implement mmus and stuff we're going to try to port nitrous 9 to it etc as well so it should make for some interesting times and he's already built boards uh based on the uh, z80 and the 6502 previously so he's had some experience doing this before so looking forward to it next up coco town had another one and this is a bit of a side uh video here because he's been talking a lot about you know video and optimizations and how to do nice tricks with the vdg and the sam etc but this one here he's actually he he mentions at the beginning about actually i'll just play the little intro that'll kind of tell you what's going on but it's it's not the normal thing it's not concentrating on the cocoa it's concentrating on main hello and welcome in a previous video i described my work trying to fix a bug in the trs80 color computer emulation in main first i want to thank everybody who took the time to share their comments I read all the comments. And I was quite surprised how many people commented on this one remark that I made. So I figured, what the heck, while well, I'm at it, let's see if maybe I can tweak some of these values and try to get Dragonfire working a little bit better. An issue is that the builds take a long time. Just linking alone can easily take 20 or 30 minutes. 20 or 30 minutes. 20 or 30 minutes. 20 or 30 minutes. Yes, that did slow me down quite a bit. And many of you expressed outrage at the inhumane conditions I experienced. Today, we right a wrong. So basically, they, they I, a lot of the people that comment on the video gave him some alternatives uh, for, I think, Clang specifically. And the linking times go down mega drastically is about the only way i can describe it so i'll let you find out exactly what proportion they went down by but it's it's really up there it saves a lot of time there's no more 20 to 30 minutes doing linking anymore uh but it kind of shows you like you know discovering what was going wrong and what to do to fix it so if any of you are doing this kind of thing you might want to watch this video if you're having the same issue Next up, um, for those of you that missed the Steve Bjork memorial that we did, uh, we ran his bouncing ball demo um, that he wrote for OS9. And uh, Alan Huffman had never seen it before and didn't even remember it. I remember it being out back in 86. It was actually originally, I think, on the Coco 1 and 2 OS9. I don't think it even needs a Coco 3. And then uh, Alan's you know, speculating, like, how did it work? Well, if it's a Coco 1 and 2, which I'm pretty sure it is, all the screens are directly mapped, so you can basically do whatever you want. But for those of you that maybe missed the uh, the tribute, I'll just uh, play a couple seconds of it so you can see what it is. And this will be included on EOU 1.1 or 1.0.1, getting released hopefully soon if I can get off work long enough. Next up, uh, Bill Pierce, uh, who is the person who is the author of, uh, what the heck is this GUI? file manager thing under next thing called uh, somebody else remember it's M something 
It's based on the Altimuse engine that uh, Mike Knutson wrote. On my M shell. So there's been uh, talk about people trying to run um, Nitrous Nine under emulators. Uh, XROAR in particular does not support the MU disk, which MAME, VCC, and OVCC all do. And uh, I think if I remember, Kieran requires an IDE driver for his to work. Um, so basically, Bill has put up some instructions and an HDB ROM image um, that he put up in the Nitrostein group on Facebook. And this will uh, allow you to run the Super ID E D E L L in VCC. So you can get DL or VCC to run basically the same version of Nitrostein as XWR requires to run. So you can actually share the image, I guess, between the two. So he's got the ROM itself as an upload in the Nitrostein group on Facebook. And then he also made a text file. Uh, explaining how to set it up to actually do the running itself. So if you do this, you should be able to handle both. Now, I think, I'm trying to remember if it was Michael Furman, but somebody had made an EOU version that actually had this Super ID specifically to run under XROAR, which should also run with this here under VCC as well as you want, if you want an alternate uh, from the MU disk driver. Now, the MU disk driver, it's not a real hardware, obviously, but it's also a much smaller driver, which gives you a bit more system RAM to run more stuff in Nitrous 9. So I prefer using it myself personally. But if you have real hardware, especially if you have the Super ID from Cloud9, then you definitely would want to check this out. Uh, but he's got the instructions and the actual ROM image there that you can download from the Nitrous 9 group on Facebook. So thank you, Bill Pierce. Uh, next up, uh, Brenda Mac Make or Mackie? I can't remember how to pronounce her name. I think it's Make. Hopefully I got it right. My apologies if it's not. Uh, but she's been making some progress in what she's calling the Coco 5 case. So this is basically, uh, it's a 3D case that she's working on, um, which is kind of a modernized version of a Coco 3 case. Uh, she's also planning on making it big enough to fit a modern full-size keyboard with a mere keypad, etc. Um, currently, the current design she has will not work with a Coco 3 motherboard or the Athena board, like uh, Bob has been working with by Pedro. Um but she has some details on it as well as some photos uh, with, ex you know, proposed extended keyboards. So, so she has a big description here about, you know, the tolerances of making it, you know, kind of roughly fit. But you can see, I'll just put pictures here. You can see it's kind of got these back plates here. Um, she's got mm -hmm. the Tandy nameplate right on there to show you the scale. So it's a little bit wider than the standard Cocoa 3. And these can be used for, uh, you know, Cocoa Pies, et cetera, too. So this is one part, though. Who's going to print it? I, I sure can. Her, I guess <laughs> yeah. that's that's a big part. I mean, yeah. there's the specific measurements. That's cool. full size, I assume. Is it? Yeah, what? yeah, it's full size. So what's going to yeah. print it? Or, or bigger than full size? Because if it can fit in, fill it in a keyboard like this with the actual you know mirror keypad oh, built maybe, in, maybe yeah. Probably it's cool. The size but... of an HX, isn't it? I guess you could get it printed at JLC or someplace, but yeah. Cool. Yeah, I don't know how expensive that that can, like I remember John Strawn saying even just doing a, a Google three size case was going to be hugely expensive because a big yeah. jump when you do that size. It's a good idea, especially if someone makes a uh, a Coco three or Coco four other motherboard or something right. or other, you can at least get a case. Someone needs to make a three part case that like the three sections go together, so. Uh, common printer can print it but yeah. i'm not the one to do it that's hard yeah so the printers that do this size are hugely expensive now as you were mentioning rick there's you know third parties that have these larger printers you can go submit a design and get it printed but i have no idea what the cost of those are right unless it's going to be injected molding that would be nice <laughs> that would be, that would be expensive so even cost, more so <laughs> do, you have, do you have a few grand to lend us for that there nick or Oh, a yeah. few grand ain't going to do it. That should be just like half your sales of Neutroid, right? Some some tens of grands, please. <laughs> well, tens of grand, I think, is if you have the printer. I'm just talking about, you know, getting a, a manufacturer that already has these printers. Well, not to, to get the mold to make your, your 3D printer. Oh, for, yeah, yeah. Going, you need Injection molds yeah, would not be cheap. What does she say in the email, in the message there? It just says extended keyboard proposal? Yeah, but does she talk about how That's she's going to... How to do it? Or can we get one from? Uh, it? Oh, you mean in the main, the main article? I'll yeah. Make sure. oh, yeah. So, is it just me? I'm just I'm looking at this on my end. 
is it just me or do I see um, rendering noise on these images? Are well, these, these are renders. These are not physically manufactured. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> like the design files are done so somebody could pick this up and go. And that's what 100 millimeters by 100 millimeters. And that is the board footprint. Okay. So she's not. Yeah, she mentioned yeah, the PC boards can be roughly 80 by 100 millimeters, give or take okay. with the notches. So, will your Cocos 3 sit in your 3D printer? If it can, you could print it. <laughs> yeah. Like, I know that the product, like PCB Way and stuff like now, can print circuit boards for dirt cheap because they, of course, do it in Well, fall. yeah, they do this too. Um, so, do they, is, is the prices on 3D printing these larger things come down in the last couple of years? Because I know we looked at this a few years back and it was like astronomical. Right. But has that come down if you're getting it manufactured by one of these bigger companies versus trying to buy your own printer? I think Jameco mm -hmm. has a service like that or one, one of those electronics yeah, houses. They, they all do the same thing at the same time, but I guess we don't it's know crazy. and need to find out. Some so I remember John Strong quoted the original Coco 3 case, which he had to do his, as a multi-print to get it to go. I think he was mentioning it was going to be like $110 at the time, basically for him to do it himself to make one. Somebody printed right. a Lamborghini on their small machine. Cost thirty, forty thousand dollars to do it, but <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm thinking now that this is getting more and more popular. Though some of these larger like PCB right. way, et cetera, might be able to do it for cheaper, especially if you start ordering multiple ones of the same one. Like if this becomes a thing where people want this case to fit Coco Pies or the Coco right. Four upgrades, if Pedro decides to expand beyond the Coco Three, et cetera. Um, I mean, she's got a great design with the knockout back plates, so you just do three sections of what you want rather than have to modify the entire it's design. Crazy. It's a good idea. Yeah. I do like her keyboard, too, like the, the mirror keypad and some that adds more, things. more expense, too. It's going to be way. If people are complaining that a Coco 3 is expensive at four or five. Well, at the rate the Coco 3 is going, they might be the same cost nowadays. <laughs> well, I suspect this might be more. 128k Coco Three is going for like 350 bucks US right now. I've seen in multiple. Yeah, but instances. you 3D print a case and then a keyboard, power supply, and that... another motherboard. I think it'll go. Well, more the motherboards. That. How much are those, uh, Bob? Because you actually bought a few, so you know what they cost. Yeah, but if you want one that's assembled, you don't want to sit there and build it. I'm sure Bob would volunteer. It's a start. It, it's a. It's a start. Yeah, I'll build them. Yeah. So, We've so Bob, what do you say the cost was of the board and parts? I think Pedro is selling the board itself for twenty five bucks, and then the parts you can pretty much get everything you need, almost everything from DigiKey, but some of the mm -hmm. stuff will have to come from Mauser and or even Jameco. But mm -hmm. uh, right around, I'm thinking a little less than a hundred total. Maybe even less than that, but I've so that's really... parts and the motherboard itself for less right. than hundred. Yeah, yeah. But I've once, never really tallied it. Up. But once we've paid you two and a quarter an hour to put it together for us, what's the total yeah, cost? Yeah, that's the thing. <laughs> and that's well, the thing is, if, if you if you get it manufacturing friendly, I mean, Frank can start blasting those off. Oh yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. Retro rewind because he's. It might be cheaper to buy find a uh, a Coco three. It's it's a bit of on a wash now. Hand, on the other hand, on eBay. She's the other hand, this right. would be a Coco Four if you design it right, right? Like you, you yeah, get the expanded, updated about, motherboard. Oh, right. you yeah, you got more room in a Raspberry Pi. Now you don't need a big case like the Coco for a Raspberry Pi. Make a smaller case. Make a little box and have an external. Yeah. Well, John Strong Pi. was selling Raspberry Pi Coco Three cases, which are like scaled down models for a. a yeah, Pi. do a. Like you see at the moment, everyone's selling micro Commodore sixty fours and micro Atari uh, yeah. four hundreds and well, but that's cool. missing the point. What if you want to play with sixty eight oh nine hardware? This could do that too. It's not limited to being a Raspberry Pi case. It could yeah. be an actual Coco case. I, I see potential. I mean, she's kind of showing like a Raspberry Pi or something similar in this little board here as an yeah. example. So, I mean, you can use it both ways, I guess, is what, what you're saying there, Rick, and that's that's true. Right. Well, that's what she set up the PC stands, uh, the PC uh, uh, standoffs for, too. It was specifically, yeah. it's look, yeah, it looks specifically designed to be a multi-purpose case. You want and those other yeah. two, two boards, 
therefore adding stuff to it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, if, you're, if you're going the cocoa pie route, but this would work like, like they said, both ways. If you want to do the actual cocoa hardware type thing, it will fit in this case just fine. And if you want to use Raspberry Pi, it'll fit in this case just fine because you got extra room. So cocoa three and a cocoa two in the same case. Awesome. Now that photo, is that a rendered photo? Yeah, these are all renders. These are all renders. Yeah, I thought so because it looks very clean. I thought <laughs> if she's hit, um, yeah, it's um, not yellowing smooth. nothing. What the heck? No, I'm just kidding. Well, it's very smooth. If it was a a uh, a printed one, they're usually a bit rougher than that. Yeah, yeah. Unless it's a very expensive. But the, one. the thing is, I mean, if if you go for bulk to get the cost down, if you're making a, a case that is generic enough to be used for a, a pie based system or a real Coco three, quote unquote, you know, with Pedro's updated board that maybe includes the Gimme X built into it and that kind of thing, having only one design, you could actually probably print, you know, more right. of them for cheaper, and then sell them to both markets as opposed to splitting it. Exactly. And considering a 128k with... Coco three right now, like I said, is three to three hundred fifty bucks sometimes on eBay. And you know, if you got one of these here, um, you'd you'd be having like a Gimme X and two meg RAM on there, plus the case, plus a keyboard for we the same have... price or less. We should invite her on. I think I tried before. I don't Why think she wants to come on live. I don't know. Video just stuff. like uh, what what's an, what's her name that did the pink cocoa? We scare people. Um, <laughs> Elizabeth, a bunch of old white guys with beards. Who would scare us? <laughs> yeah, because Elizabeth, I tried inviting on, and she just doesn't want to go in in public either. She might att occasionally attend a cocoa fest, but she doesn't want to be like on camera type thing. So some people just don't want. It's good to be. Just keep it's making a good things. Idea. I like the idea. I'm just wondering, can it really be made economically? I don't know. Well, the other thing is, too, is that the price of a Cocoa 3 is a moving target and it's going up. So eventually in a year, that it right. might be this is half the price of a Cocoa 3 real one going on. Well, then maybe the time comes when like a Pedro board is the only way you can play with 8-bit computers anymore. So we're going to need a case like this to put it in and, uh, you know, carry the yeah, Cocoa Yeah, and, and you, I mean, you have enough extra room here because it's bigger than the Cocoa case. So you can, say, maybe build in a multi-pack and change the top of the case to have rooms with slots. Any weird thing you want to do? Combine it, yeah. combine it all, or you could, you know, do like the sock master one that uh, is behind Ron's background there, which is basically, you know, like New Air keypad, which actually does look quite similar to that. Yeah. Not quite. It's a little bit different. The break keys, she's got it at the, you know, the upper right corner of the Amer keypad portion, whereas sock masters has it up in the old location where the delete key is here. But and, and his vents run uh, parallel to the side instead of across. Yeah, and his was a mock-up too. Obviously, he didn't make one of those. Yeah, but. yeah. She she's pulled hers tight without the cursor keys. They're built into the number pad, so it's not going to take as much space as Ron's mock-up, which is uh, yeah. His arrow keys kind of in between the main keyboard and the numeric keyboard. Yeah, that's that's even more to stretch it out. Which you know, okay. Or well, you could have arrow keys in both places. Well, you know, the Amstrad yeah, had a cassette recorder built right into the computer and it was about six and a half feet wide <laughs> <laughs> it's like a ti-99 with all the extended stuff, stuff. Yeah. i kind of drew up my own little concept here if you look i've got my oh here i'll stop sharing up. so you can share it a sec if i can i'm coming i'm coming so i was thinking of uh sort of along the lines of a tandy 1000 style case yeah, box. Okay, we see a right. fuzzy mess. <laughs> yeah, sorry. I can't fix that. I'm but hoping that because it's a I'm static image, it might box. catch up the bandwidth and actually sharpen it up. But Yeah, one would think. It's basically a 12 and a half inch wide by, I think, 7 inches deep. Just big enough for the motherboard with a little bit of slack on the sides. On the front panel, there's a power button and two joystick ports and a keyboard port. On the back, you've got your cassette, serial, video outputs, and reset button. Basically, it. it yeah, unfortunately, it's not clearing, it's clearing up the image, so it's kind of hard to tell what parts you're talking about there. But And then you've got to get yeah, a, sorry. a separate keyboard, yeah. Basically, I can kind of see the keyboard's in the middle mm -hmm. to the right, right? And you got a cable going up to the connector, it looks like? Yeah, it's an external yeah. keyboard. 
Yeah. Yeah, and quite a few people back in the nineties did that. They'd have the extension, like a six foot ribbon cable or something coming out for or even longer for the actual Coco keyboard, yeah, or in the case the, of the uh, Bob Puppo XT interface, you can actually take an IBM PC keyboard. Indeed. Right. I think I remember Marty Goodman had one like that. Yes. I still have new Puppo keyboards in the original factory packaging, in other words, a bag, <laughs> that I could sell. <laughs> well, wasn't, is it, isn't Cloud9 still selling those too, or...? Am I mistaken? I have no idea. You you would need an original XT keyboard to use it. So, yeah, that's why I, I like market. the TC9 used an no. AT keyboard, which I much preferred because you had full control over the lights, like the num lock and the caps right. lock. Whereas on XT keyboard, you toggle it. You have no idea what state it's in if the machine crashed. Even on a PC, you don't know what state it's in if the machine crashed. You have to power it off to get it back to a known state. You know what really bites about uh, bites about this is like it seems that you know if you say you wanted to use a USB keyboard. It seems like the 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 unit that would be processing the USB keyboard to talk to the Coco motherboard would have more powerful of a microprocessor than the processor in the color computer. Yes. Oh yeah, well, big it time. Does. Yeah. <laughs> it's like my whereas, whereas these old a adapters usually had like a, a sixty five hundred one or something the, or six five hundred two. Yeah, yeah. The Pupo yeah. used a sixty five hundred two to do its processing, but it was a whole separate little world. It used up all of its CPU to do that. So, hey, think, I'll take back over. Okay. Hang on. I think, in practical sense, oh, anyway, okay, moving cat. on. Hang on, I got to tape the cat back to the wall. Tape the cat to the wall, <laughs> quick. <laughs> Broke loose. Standing the up duct tape. Are you standing him up against the wall, are you? Firing squad. <laughs> Just blue tack the cat. Velcro. <laughs> It'll stick. <laughs> Balloon and a glass rod. <laughs> so is it sharing now, Mark? Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. I was waiting for... Yeah, I just couldn't spotlight you. <laughs> okay, so next up, uh, some more from Alan Huffman. This time I'm more on the programming side of things. So uh, this first article actually covers a couple of different machines. Basically, he's put up a bunch of his source code. Um, most of it was for the VIC-20, like here, but he's got some Cocoa stuff here, too. Like, he's got his all RAM BBS. This is a BBS he ran back in the early 80s off of a cassette deck because he didn't have disk drives yet. So everything was loaded into RAM. <laughs> uh, I think he had 64K, I remember. But basically, the whole BBS system just loads once off tape and just runs. And then he's got some other stuff that he's put up here, too, including a upcoming blog series for a Lights Out game for the Coco. Was it a six-hour tape? Well, no, it just it, it was a very minimal BBS. Let's put it that way. <clears throat> and of course, you know, the message base would disappear if you had a power failure or, you know, he shut the machine down. But you can actually go to his GitHub and actually grab this. And he's got some stuff that he'll be writing blogs about in the future. It hasn't actually come out yet. But uh, so he's got a bunch of his projects. And I think this was kind of instigated by the passing of Steve Bjork because of Alan and him are actually pretty good friends to their, you know, mutual love of Disney and stuff and Disney parks. And, you know, he saw what happened when, you know, you don't put your stuff out either publicly or don't have a willfully instated as to where stuff should go. So I think he's trying to make sure his stuff doesn't get lost. Something I've kind of been doing by building in all the source code for everything I do under Nitro Stein in Nitro Stein. You guys get it as soon as you download it. Another one he's been working on, um, and this is kind of continuing on from the VIC-20 one we covered earlier, where he was kind of converting that one game from uh, Petsky text to uh, p 4 graphics. He's doing a simple 8x8 and 16x16 tank um, driving type thing. It's not a full game yet uh, in Color Basics. So this is using even byte get put buffers where you don't use the comma G optional, which I covered, I think, on the Coco Tech first episode as one of the fill-ins in between Sloopy stuff. Um, that version of the graphics on the Cocoa, especially with larger uh, get put buffers, is actually like three times faster than the standard get put buffers. So you can actually do you know a bit more arcadey style games. So he's actually got the source listing on his blog here for both versions of it, and then he's actually got uh, the code running here. And this is the second version. He actually had a bit of sound in here and left tracks behind. So you kind of get the puttering motor when you when you stop. 
And this is the 8x8, so actually we'll run a bit uh, faster. The original version was a bit flickery, didn't leave tracks, didn't have sound. So he's having fun doing that. And I, I, I've been done doing some experiments, and I think I showed some of them on the Coco Tech 2, where you can actually use a get put buffer to scroll the entire P Mode 4 screen. And it's actually not bad. It's it's almost as fast as like a poorly written assembly language program, which is kind of what Basics P Copy command is like. Um, but you can actually do some pretty pretty cool stuff on it. Uh, next up, this is a quick little YouTube short video. And unfortunately, on YouTube Shorts, I have no control over the volume. I can just mute it. I hate YouTube Shorts. I wish people would quit using them. They're also in the stupid vertical format I hate as well. Have well, I said bad enough stuff about YouTube today? Um, so basically, this is his update on the Coco Porta Fujinet from Thomas Cherry Homes. And this will be kind of the stuff he'll be demonstrating at VCF SoCal. And this one shows that the network subdevice is fully implemented and is currently debugging that portion of the code. Now, since it's a short and it's only, I think, a minute and a half, I'll just play the whole thing so people that have not been able to keep caught up with the Fujinet Coco port will kind of know where it's standing at. And my apologies if this is too loud, but I have no control over it. Uh, Tom Trams here with the Fujinet project, and I have finished porting the network device over from the Atari to the Coco. So right now the network device has acts like the Atari in itself. So here's a little test program on this test disk here. And if we run it, it will pull file off the web server and display it. There we go. So there we go. That's being pulled off of HTTPS through the protocol adapter and all the way back through to the Cocoa. So it's starting to breathe. More to come later. So, Mark, I think you'd mentioned that you didn't think or didn't know if, if Tom had done any updates uh, recently this past week or so. That was one he threw in as a YouTube short. Yeah, I, yeah, I saw it on, um, um, actually, he posted it on our Discord, the Coco Discord. And also, I saw he put an announcement on uh, the TRS-80 Color Computer Group, too. So, Yeah. I, he must watch your show a little bit because I noticed that if you take a look at the top of the screen here, it says buriedbu.com, which is like, is that buried bucks or what is that? Because that was a game we had on our challenge recently. So I don't know if that's related or if that's just fluke. Mm. Uh, next up, and this is actually um, probably already mm. running, actually. So the next step, a live YouTube of uh, Terrace 80 Trash Talk, which covers all the, the Terrace 80s and is hosted by the Trash Talk people that help sponsor Tandy Assembly as well. Uh, the, for some reason, this... This particular episode, they decided to start a couple hours earlier than previous. So actually, it's overlapping with our show. So I think this has already been running for 20 some odd minutes. Um, I have no idea what's being discussed, and I won't be able to get there to check until after our show is over. So, but uh, the... so are we ready for the outro then? <laughs> <laughs> no, I got that more is, news to cover. <laughs> that is the prettiest model one I've ever seen in terms of, uh, you know, assembly and all the covers and all the. Do you think there's a little bit of Photoshop to it here? Do you think that's real? No, that that's that's real. That's all right. I've got one exactly like that. That's that's absolutely correct. It's got all the right covers for like the the cable that feeds into the expansion cover that no one has. And uh, <laughs> well, there is one thing missing. What's that? What? The name tag on the first drive or the drive on the left. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, you're right. Oh, fall, uh, throw it away. No good. <laughs> <laughs> Dumpster now. <laughs> and he's got only one cover, evidently. Well, he's, he's using it. Cool. You can't put all the you can't put the monitor and the keyboard cover on. But you're the cassette cover, it, you only on. need occasionally. He's got it hooked up. At any rate, their show usually lasts two hours and no longer. They're pretty strict on ending it, unlike us. <laughs> um I don't even know how to do that, to be honest. I'm oh. yeah. <laughs> so it's already been running for almost half an hour. So depending on how long it takes me to get through the rest of the news here, you might be able to catch the tail end of it. But of course, you can replay it on YouTube afterwards, too. And I have no idea what's being discussed. I'm assuming they'll be talking about Tandy Assembly and the Tandy Meetup, since both of those got announced fairly recently. Uh, the dates for the Tandy Assembly 2024 and then also, you know, details, I'm assuming, on the Meetup at uh, VCF Southwest. Uh, well, while you have this here, has anybody made their Model 1 monitor work on a Coco 2? I did. It's a TV. You can you can hook it it's up. It's a black and white TV, yeah. 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 And it's essentially composite. Yeah. Yeah, it should work in a Coco 3, I'd imagine. Just plug it in, or does it have a weird refresh rate or something? 
No, no, no it'll, it'll work on the Coco 3. Yeah. Of course, you know, Coco 3 being a color computer, I wouldn't really yeah. want to black and white because I didn't <laughs> right. like running on black and white back in the day. <laughs> but it's as soon as I afforded a color TV, I was gone out of that mono stuff. Well, it's um, it's a black and white screen, so white being every color. So right. it is a color system. Well, actually, in, in Nick's case, since you guys didn't have artifact colors, it kind of looked like this anyway, right? Yeah. Yeah, kind of. <laughs> vertical stripes of black and white. Woo-hoo. What, what's that game that started on this machine? I can't remember it. Yeah. Oh, lots of games. Oh, we don't know. It started with an N, right? Yeah. It It was called called Neuter or something like that, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Neuter. It was a a game changer, that one. (laughs) At any rate, you you can definitely check out their show after we're done here if it's still going. It should be going for another hour and a half. I'm guessing I don't think we'll take that long. Maybe. Uh, Next up, Tier City uh, Retro Programming. Um, put up two videos this week. The first one is just going through Coco Ultimate. Um, he subtitled this The Essence of Turn Taking, and this is basically how to control two different player characters with a single joystick while playing. So he's kind of going through some options that he decided to try. <clears throat> and your players can move and attack, etc. You got the little snake thing. I won't bother playing the actual video here. You can, you can check it out 17 minutes. Now, one interesting thing here that happened during this is he actually started posting some questions. I think some are directed at me because I've been kind of pressuring him. You should try to get to the Coco 3 stuff, you know, because uh, he always is complaining like the graphics resolution and color set and the speed of the Coco 2 um, is not what he has hoped it would be. And we've been giving him tips on using like even bite you know, get put buffers and stuff too to try to help him out. He doesn't like using the um, high speed poke on the Coco One and Two, even under the emulator because he's running XWAR. And Kieran, correct me if I'm wrong, but the, what he claims is that if you run the C save command in XWAR at double speed, it actually screws up like it would do on a real Coco when you try to read it back, and it won't read it back properly. So he's actually you know bombed out a few of his programs and lost them because he couldn't reload them back in. Now I don't know on a real Coco if you did another poke to extend the length of the header, the tape header, it actually does work. I've actually loaded stuff at double speed, even on a Coco 1 and 2. Um, but, you know, it's it would just be easier. But a lot of the complaints he has, like he has to take all of this program code to draw text on the screen. Well, you know, on the Coco 3, that's just hprint. It's nice and easy. He's also, you know, he's running out of room on some of his uh, games and stuff that he's been doing. And if you use Coco 3 graphics, those graphics come from outside basics. You can do a P-Clair 1 and actually get yourself 4.5K back of basic and still have all this extra color, extra graphics, built-in text, and a bunch of things, double speed, palette animations, all kinds of things. I've been trying to convince him. And he actually started asking some pointed questions on this kind of stuff. So maybe I'm finally wearing him down after a year to consider trying the Coco 3 out. So I'm kind of curious to say. I'll be working on Henry next, uh, but, you know, that'll take a while. So... Uh, yep. <laughs> <laughs> Except that you, I think, I'll approach from the Nitrous Nine side of things, not just the Coco Three. <laughs> <laughs> Multitasking, baby. Um, <laughs> and then his second video here, he's decided to do a bit of a walkthrough. What was that? We're saying, "Don't very hair gun hot." <laughs> <laughs> his second video released here. Goes through a bit of uh, extending Coke Ultimate, so he's kind of drawn in a border and kind of made it a play field. He's going to have uh, status bars for the players, up to four RPG characters. So he's got kind of fighter wizard here, and he'll have your health bars and stuff. So he's just basically doing more screen layout. So here he shows the layout kind of surrounding. He's going to have the title card up here, stats on the bottom. Um, then he goes through and does a bit of a mock-up without doing a full animation of things here. And he's got four of the same character, but obviously he's got different ones in the real game, kind of with your live status bars. And then, you and know, a bit of an animation. So. What's that? What, what what P mode is he using? One Three? in this case. One, One. yeah. Yeah, I was just going to say. It is kind of funny, too, because I know a lot of us hate the pastel thing, and he actually he said he's come to prefer it for a game like this, so he's using the... He's doing Second a good job. Stuff. I was going to say he's doing quite well with the uh, limited colors. Yeah, the I only mean, thing that's was... hard to read here is like the wizard on the bottom because that orange on magenta just does not show up all that well. <laughs> no, no, it doesn't. <laughs> it does vibrate a bit. Cyan or, or white would be fine, but 
uh, orange it just gets too washed out so i also mentioned to him by the way if you do this on a coco three you can change the palette you can keep the res the same if you want <laughs> but you can change the colors to whatever the heck you want wearing them down folks <laughs> and, and then he went back to just kind of his ghost saga retrospective so he's kind of going through the te techniques he'd learned to do in that case where he's using p copy that even though it has to draw these big boxes around and get put buffers when you know characters pass in front of trees or houses or something like that it's still flicker free it's a little bit slow because p copy is not a well-written routine i've taken a look at it it's pretty dumb but uh Kind of goes through like, like what what do you accomplish in that game? What do you'd like to do different on Coco Ultimate and stuff here? And he showed some of his separate ones, separate screens he's got on that game, which is basically done too. So I, I look forward to his response because the, the first video that I responded to with all of his questions about the Coco 3, Coco 3 speeds, graphics, etc. He posted early in the week and I've been busy with work, so I didn't get a chance to answer until last night. Um, so I'll be interested to see what his response is. And maybe I, I can convince him. Now... Being P mode one, mm -hmm. now, in P mode one, you can, um, can you just select which, you can open up multiple P mode one screens, right? Four of them, up to four if you do P clear eight, yes. Yeah, so is there a way to do some sort of um, double buffering from basic? Well, he's kind of doing that. He's he's not doing it the way I tried to explain to him. I don't, I don't mm. know if he fully understands how double buffering works. What he's doing is that he's pre-drawn the different screens. He's got one where you're in front of a house. This is the graveyard scene. There's also a uh, a river bridge scene, I think. But he's basically drawing on one screen and peacocking it after it's done the drawing so that you don't see the ripple effect of you know erasing the old graphic and then putting the new one on. So it actually runs fairly smooth. It's just a little bit slow because he's using peacocking. So it's literally copying mm -hmm. the bottom half of the screen, a high, one and a half K every single time. You have to figure out... So you can see it's running a bit slow, but there's no flicker. Now, the yeah, get put buffers, of course, are blocking out the yeah, rectangle. Um, but it restores the background as it goes, which is what he really screens. wanted to do. That was the critical thing for him. Yeah, and um, and that, that part works. I mean, honestly, if if the Coco 1 and 2, if you copy your ROMs to RAM, uh, I could probably give you an optimized stack blasted version of P copy that would be much, much faster than this. And better yet, if you have a 6 or 9, I could kick it in native mode and use a TFM. And this would speed the thing up like three to four times what it's doing now. Um, <laughs> that's even before you get to the Coco 3 and start adding like full double speed. Mm, just wondering if there's a... He might need a little machine code subroutine to to help him with the whatever is very slow. P copy command. Up. Yeah. Well, Honestly, like if you have 64K, I could patch basic to fix that. Fair yeah, bit. the pink copy though, it does an entire screen, doesn't it? No, you can do a page. And uh, this is two pages, this mode. So he's only doing the bottom half. He's only doing the bottom uh, oh, half, okay. which is 1.5K. Okay, that, that would help. Yeah. Yeah. No, he did as much as he could given the, the circumstances that he's stuck with. But so, the uh, P copy is like a load A, store A routine, or is it a load D at least? But it's there's no stack blast or anything that's much yeah. faster. So. so is he, um, do you know if he's drawing on one page and then yeah he does all the rendering on the second page right uh including a p copy from a third page that actually has the background and then he and then he copies. overlays the characters and stuff and then p copies it to the main viewable page that has the okay. ghost saga permanently up there and if you added points and stuff it'd be up there too i'm so just seeing a double p copy between frames which is a bit yeah so slow. if he if he uh draws up the next frame and then view that finished frame and sort of bounce back. Yeah, if he back. alternated frames. Alternate, that's it, yeah. Like, basically, he's doing one P copy too many if you want to optimize it for speed. Yeah, you have to do yeah. the background P copy first, which he's doing, like, the gravestones in this particular scene we're looking at here. And then render the player and the arrow and anything else animated that's going on on top of that, and then immediately display that screen would be faster. Now, I think yeah, the reason he yeah. did it, he was trying to save memory. And the Ghost Saga graveyard part is on the other page, the first page on the screen. And that doesn't change. So right. he's basically just copying stuff over top the bottom half and leaving the top part alone. So he's always displaying the same page, zero and one. Uh, I see. But two, three, four will have different bottom halves. And then you'll have the yeah. background by itself and then a background with everything merged on it. Then he P copies that. But yeah, if you, if you wrote it in such a way 
maybe duplicated the top part too, just to save the time there, you could literally, you know, skip one entire P copy and basically change it from a 3K copy per frame to a one and a half. Well, he's doing good hmm. so far, but yeah, basic is is yeah is low. Yeah, it, it is. But I mean, the there. basic, like the get put with that G option removed, and you make sure it's an even byte boundary, which is complicated it's by the fact up, that yeah. basic scales everything depending what mode you're in. <laughs> that screwed me up a few times. But once you get it going, it's it's pretty quick. You can pretty do some pretty decent stuff. That's what Alan's experimenting with his tank game, actually. Next up, this is an interesting one. This is a Dutch site called Retro Mel's. And uh, he's doing a almost half hour video here on digitizing some color computer tapes. And he's going through recording them into Audacity, uh, trying to clean them up if he's had problems, uh, trying to you know adjust volume inputs, et cetera. And he's inherited a bunch of tapes for the Coco. There's a Coco one, as you can see in the picture here. Um, some of it was, you know, you know, standard pirated stuff, maybe some, you know, text change to be for the native language. Uh, but other stuff was actually, you know, handmade by somebody who owned the system before him. And he's been archiving this stuff off. And he, this video here is about what he has to do to get the archiving to work, how to get some tapes to load, splicing tapes if he has to. Um, he tried splicing the raw Audacity file because he had one... You could see in the uh, Audacity graph that it kind of dive bombed the volume level. So there's one little chunk of tape that was missing. So he decided, you know, maybe if I just cut that part out, of course, that just causes an error because <laughs> that data's lost, right? And now everything's short and it doesn't quite fit the block size. But uh, if you want to see what he's been able to recover, he's got his own site as well um, that he's putting all this stuff on. And that's retromelsarchive.com slash coco.html. Of course, you can get the show links from the Discord if you want to save yourself time to type them in from looking on the screen or from me reading them out loud. Um, also, so that's information on getting XOR, et cetera, running here too. But all of these here are downloadable from the files that he's gotten. And here's some of the files that are actually there and some screenshots from some of them. And he's got one, like somebody wrote a little mini spreadsheet program that you can run. Um, there's an inventory program. He's also uh, got a CGP 115 printer running on there with some software on there that uh, the person used originally to create cassette labels and the cassette fold-ins for the uh, cassette case itself for listing the programs on it. So he's got some pretty cool stuff in there. And he's even got some originals here, you can see. But yeah, if you're if you're Dutch and you want to get some stuff that's actually in, in the native tongue, you can go grab them off his site. And the actual uh, informational video here on how to you know figure out you know sound settings and volume settings and that kind of stuff is actually quite quite well done too. So I definitely recommend if you're trying to preserve a bunch of tapes, it might be worth your while taking a look at this. Pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, next up, George Jansen uh, did issued issue six, lesson number six, I should say of his uh, Coco 3 6.9 assembly language programming tutorial. And here he's getting into what he calls simple graphics. And basically this is to take and make an animated multi-plane Starfield scroll by. And as usual, if you go to his channel on our Discord, you can actually save yourself the typing of all the assembly language code. And like I, as I've mentioned in previous episodes, I myself personally, I think most people work this way. If you type it in yourself, you retain it better as opposed to just loading and looking at it. So if you're trying to actually literally learn a semi language from scratch type thing on the Kogo 3. Type it, it in. Yeah, I would I would recommend it. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to crash the machine. Yeah, that's that's pretty standard. You're going to do that when you're programming assembly anyway, as I'm sure Henry and, and Nick can attest. Henrik. Um, I, yeah, but you, you do you, typing mistakes every once. So it's not a bug. You just go, oh, yeah, I missed the E there. Or the oh, a. a little typo <laughs> here. That's not a bug, yeah. Right, but read it, write it, know it. Uh -huh. So anyway, I, I, this is near the end of the video where he actually has gone through the code and how code works, et cetera, here. So I'll just play it. So I don't know how well this will show up. The the stars are just little single pixels scrolling by. So, Patrick, did you go to uh, – I mean, Rick, uh, did you go to uh, – Next lesson, when I get it done, will be uh, 128 stars. We'll take and modify this code here, add to it, and we'll do 128 stars and have some fun with that. So I've got it already done. I did it a long time ago, so I'm going to show you right here exactly what it looks like. 
There you go, 128 stars, all different colors, moving at different speeds. Okay, so that's what it is. I'll hit my cue and, and end that. Anyway, it's a nice, nice little demo. And of course, like I said, he goes through all the source code and how exactly it works here, how the subroutines work, how the structures work, etc. And it's, as far as I know, still is the only Cocoa 3 oriented assembly language tutorial series. Uh, most of the other ones we've seen have all been Cocoa 1 and 2. So if you need to learn about the gimme and how the timer interrupt works and, um, you know, FIRQ with sound routines, how the MMU works, the task register, the graphics modes, palettes, all that kind of stuff. This is pretty well the only game in town for a decent uh, tutorial. We do have some book references like the TEPCO one for the Coco 3 graphics and stuff. But uh, as far as tutorials go, this is about the only one. So I would definitely check it out. And uh, George has done a lot of programming for the Coco from way back. He wrote some of the utilities in OS 9 from the 80s that I used every day back in the day. And um, he's been programming a semi language since the 60s on mainframes. So he's definitely experienced, knows what he's doing. Next up, uh, John Linfield did a couple of updates on his blog. And this is actually for the MC10 and the Alice, basically. So he's been blogging about some Unix style assembler bin utils that he's been making available. And basically, this is going to uh, be a way to replace the standard assembly tools that the uh, MC10 has with a more modern style that actually has linking and stuff and, and libraries you can build in. So you don't have to reassemble an entire program from scratch every time. You can break it into pieces. And if some pieces don't change, it doesn't reassemble. It just makes the the table, linking tables, et cetera. Kind of like RMA and OS9 works, if you're familiar with that, or the C compiler in OS9 works as well. So he did two basic uh, posts here. The first one is basically talking in general and you know some sample programs for the MC10 using the 6803 microprocessor. It's not a 6809. And then he did a follow-up here uh, a few days later. Uh, and this gets more into the linking details and explaining how that works. And creating the files, uh, library files for, for that kind of thing too. But there's more still coming. So this is going to be an ongoing series for a while. But if you're interested in doing MC10 machine language programming, this, this will actually be, help speed things up for you pretty drastically and make it easier and make it more modern development-wise as well. Uh, next, after that, in the MC10 group on Facebook, James Host posted a PDF that is an annotated disassembly of the entire microcolor basic ROM, which is an 8K ROM, which is mostly color basic on the Cocoa, but with a few extended bits thrown in and a few unique things like saving and loading arrays off tape that the, the Cocoa never had. So if you want a complete assembly of how those routines work and even figure out where to make calls into it, if you want to you know, call the ROMs to do certain things for you rather than writing your own assembly language code, you can do that as well. So you can grab that in the MC10 group on Facebook. And, uh, oops, I put that in the wrong section in the news. Oh, well. Um, <clears throat> Retro Crazy, which is not a channel on YouTube I'm previously aware of, uh, did a video that's almost half an hour long doing a repair and restoration of his Dragon 32. And this is one that he's had in a collection of a bunch of retro computers he has. And he actually has had it for five years and never touched it, never opened the box. And now he finally got to it. So he did some changes on the power supply and stuff. I'm not positive it needed all these changes, like replacing caps, et cetera. But it got up and running. And then he demonstrated a couple games like uh, Chucky Egg, which is a fairly common one to try on. He really liked the keyboard. Uh, he figured the computer's a lot lighter than he expected considering the size. And there's a lot of empty space in there, which is actually kind of nice for doing, you know, add-on boards and stuff that fit with some that within the case. Uh, I won't play that all here, but uh, definitely it's, it's, it's a pretty cool video to check out. Uh, next up, Julian Brown also did some updates in the Dragon group on Facebook. He's working on an FPGA replacement for the VDG, which sounds like something... Henry might be sitting later on, and I know he's AC's, I think, has done some stuff like this. Uh, definitely the Coco VJ from Brendan, of course. Um, so he's done a couple progress reports for it on here. Uh, his first post from January 18th. Uh, I can't post anything visual on the subject yet, but I'm making headway on my 6847 replacement project at last. It generates graphics mode screens without any trouble, and I'm most of the way going through the alpha screen modes. And he's going to be adding in options for doing stuff like uh, having you know reprogrammable character sets, like we were discussing with Henry earlier, and yeah. which also works on uh, Brendan's Coco VGA board. Um, except I think in this case he's picking chips that are still fairly available. 
And then he did another update, uh, which actually has a bit of a graphic here. He says, coded up the alpha and inverse logic, ignoring the external character generator for a while yet. So just the semi-graphics and the CSS flag left on the original 6847 functionality. Uh, CSS, of course, is the color set. So that's picking between the green-based and the white-based colors. And he's got to get the higher semi-graphics and stuff working here too. But the text generator's kind of working. And he does uh, should have one or the other of these two parts to tackle this weekend. And then on to the new stuff where he starts adding in like the reprogrammable character set, which means you can do all kinds of fancy things you couldn't do before. So looking forward to that. It'll be in kind of an alternative since the VDG is pretty well identical between the Coco 1, 2, with the exception of the T1, and the Dragon 3264. This probably, I would guess, would work on either machine. It should work on a Dragon or a Coco. Um, the only exception being the Coco T1, Coco 2 T1, because that is slightly different pinouts. You'd have to make an adapter socket or something to, to move the wires around. What would be good is if uh, he can include um, programmable... Uh, not so much a palette, but something which lets you set what the four colors in each color set are out of the eight. I he mean, has do... talked about that, and he is considering doing that, where you can actually override the colors. Yeah, I mean, it's not so much adding more color, uh, but Just yeah. The, the allow... ability to replace them with with ones Just you actually would like. <laughs> you create your color set rather than the... Uh, right. the... Yeah, so <laughs> the two fixed ones. Yeah, I don't want the pink. <laughs> I was just thinking that might be easier to do than trying to then add a color. Yeah, and palette. if you make it like a single uh, I/O port address, you know, or maybe two, one yeah. to say which which color you want to change and what you want to change the color to, even if it's just a well, now eight bit with you that, are, are, are G, 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 B, B or something. Then, mm. then the question with that is, um, is he doing the color generation um, using RGB or is he doing it using YCRCB? Because um, YCRCB is actually what the EDG uses. Yeah, I, from his, my understanding from reading one of his previous posts, or maybe it was the comment he put on the post, is it's going to be RGB because he wants it to work with okay. modern monitors, et cetera, like BJ, yeah. et cetera. That makes things so much easier. Yes. <laughs> he didn't pick CYMK. Okay, uh, next one. I'm going to play the entire video here. It's a minute 29 seconds. Now, this is a... Dragon joystick that was sold back in the day called the Alte. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but he's got a really weird problem with it. And the guy's name, or at least his YouTube channel name, is Ismo Utrian. So I don't even know what country he's from. But I'm hoping that maybe somebody here who knows joystick hardware and stuff better than I do might have a clue as to what's going on. Maybe give him suggestions in the comments. So I will let him explain and show you visually what's happening. Okay. Let's demonstrate. This is the correct orientation. Is that loud enough? I go left. It goes up. I go right. It does nothing. Okay. Uh, I go up. It goes left. I go down. It goes right. Mm, um, so, okay. Uh, now it's this way, but now if I try to go up, it goes down, and if I try to go, yeah, it, now it works to up. Well, the first but question would be, is it, did it ever work correctly? <laughs> so no, it's it's all there. Useful. It's just yeah. It's well, just well, I wonder, if I, yeah. Was the first thing that, that comes to mind is it was plug way. wired correctly? No. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Yeah, right. I yeah, mean, this a... was a commercial stick, so maybe somebody who had it before him might have tried to, you know, fix something and wired it wrong. Is that what you're kind Swap of figuring? Commercial yeah, wires. Commercial wires. On what computer? No. It's our, on Dragon. Our Cocoa, our, our Cocoa, uh, our, is, are the Coco and the Dragon exactly the same in their joystick port? Yes. Yes. Okay, Should all right. Be. So, yeah. yeah, it's just got some, something just got miswired somewhere. What if he has yeah. two of these? So well, Mark, I mean, I'd... someone may inverted this on purpose because that is a thing. There are games where Maybe you can change X, Y, and well, well if you oh, think about yeah, it, you an got airplane, a... an airplane stick. If you push it forward, goes down. Yes, back, yes. Now down. that I stop and think about, it, now that you mentioned that, because that would also make sense why the uh, why the why the fire buttons would be down at the bottom because your left hand would be handling that while your right hand's handling the uh, pitch and pitch and roll. 
You're yeah. Welcome. Yeah, for a flight sim or something. Yeah, that makes sense. Or if he's just playing a space yeah, game and wants it to feel like, and, and he's a pilot and wants it to feel right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Is there a switch he doesn't realize underneath? Oh, to change it all around? Or did someone just do this? Yeah. Well, yeah, it would seem a bit silly to, to sell a joystick for one purpose, you know, have well, a switch. It, was it sold that right. way or did someone just want? Well, we'll have to ask mm -hmm. our. Uh, we'll have to dig inside. Room. We got to know. So, Brian, it, Brian it, knows. It, he has them. Yeah. So in the chat, Mark Siegel says the pots are backwards. Or a pot right? is backwards. Right. And it may be intentional that, that there is a reason to do it that way. Yeah. To make it, to make it emulate a uh, flight stick. Possibly. Yeah. That makes sense. Anyway, if one of you hardware guys, in case he has any questions beyond my scope of capability, wants to answer in the comments on his YouTube video, the link to it is in the show notes on the Discord. And hopefully, well, at least one of you will do that to try to help him out. And my last story, uh, this is for an upcoming demo scene thing going on. Um, the Love Bite 2024 demo scene. And this is a countdown, 23 days as of the time this video was uploaded this past week as to when it is. And uh, Tobok, I think that's how you pronounce it, um, has done some of these demos before. We did one with you know, moving flames and stuff on the dragon from last year, if I remember correctly. And so he's done a little animation here using all the different yellows, oranges, and reds. This includes the color set one text mode, which has a darker red and an alternate mm -hmm. orange that's a little bit different. So this, you have the widest spectrum of color you can get in a single part of the RGB spectrum is in the red, yellow area. A bit um, flame. Yeah, because you've got the regular red, you've got the regular orange, you've also got the lighter orange for the text mode and the dark red background inverse video text mode and then of course black in the middle of that too oh. that's basically just a little countdown timer the the actual demos themselves are a lot more impressive in fact last time i think he had actually had audio coming from a cassette while he was doing the demo kind of timed it and that's the end it? of the news for this week thank goodness <laughs> <laughs> sort of keep you awake nick <laughs> now we can all get some sleep now you can switch over and watch uh is bob still going i'm here can you hear me yep yep all right well, so you can continue yeah, watching bob my... or you can switch over to tier city trash yeah. talk which will be going for another hour probably well my stream is ended so yeah the case oh, okay. is on so you're too late in that case, you can go watch what you missed watching our show, uh, Bob's stream, if you want, or you can go watch Trash Talk and catch the last half of their show. Okay. I want to give me some time so I can put in chapter markers. There you go. Save he, he talks Coco, <laughs> doesn't he? He's, give me this and give me that. <laughs> All right. So um, I think part of before we leave, uh, Marco, did you have any announcements? Um, other than I haven't got any responses yet from anybody on doing the, uh, um, the virtual thing this next weekend. Um, um, Erico said he was still checking his calendar. I know I talked to Paul Fiscarelli. He said, if we pushed it off a month to the end of <laughs> February, he'd be able to make that. So I'm thinking we might have to just push it off. I hate to do that, but I'm really not getting any response one way or the other. So well, considering it's next oh, cool. weekend, I think it's time to cut bait or fish. Yeah, Sounds give good. it a month and, uh, yeah. Yep. We'll so I'm going to keep rolling around, it, but but keep it another month out. So anyway. Yep. Okay. So, so next weekend uh, will be our normal show at our normal time. Yep. 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 And the weekend after that, will be the interview with Glenn Dahlgren. Oh, sweet. Okay. Uh, anything, any other old or new business? Yes. If you uh, have a smart thermostat, remember to replace the battery in it or when the power comes back on, it won't turn your heat back on. You'll have to go <laughs> <laughs> do it all yourself. So, ain't technology oh, grand. <laughs> this winter tip, right from Rick Euland. <laughs> My dumb thermostat has no problem kicking back on as soon as the power is back on. Yeah, so, yeah. I think we're going you backwards, man. Fools. I'll be in Ohio next. Take your electric stove when the power goes out. I just need two wires and a mercury tube. <laughs> yeah. I'm just going to get some logs out of the backyard here and I'll be fine. Well, you'll be good. <laughs> All right, Ron, wave high as you pass overhead. I will. <laughs> and we'll see you all next week.
All right, so let's uh, outro. Hey, we got an outro. Here we go. This concludes another episode of The Coco Nation, the world's leading live interactive talk show featuring the Tandy Color Computer. For all things The Coco Nation, visit us on the web at thecoconation.com. We'd love to hear from you. Send feedback, suggestions, even segments via email to show at thecoconation.com. The Coco Nation Show would not exist without the community and its cast and crew. The Coco Nation theme song, copyright 2022, D. Bruce Moore. Mixed, mastered, and produced by D. Bruce Moore. The Coco Nation is over. Join us on the Coco Discord server. Coco forever.